jungle is in the life. That is how this jungle is fertile and alive. And if you take away that life, you cannot recreate it. And that is the same concept with which I approach cover crops. Cover crops are our deep reservoirs of life. Life that we can, where we can really mimic nature and let incredible diversity occur. Let it be riotous, let it grow way, way, way more than, than if we tried to have crops we could harvest from. So close, there's no way you could harvest anything from them. Yeah. Okay. So Phil has the beginning, and I'll do the welcome. Ready, Phil? Welcome, everyone. We're about to get started here. We were started, but we were moving up. Ready? Almost. I had to talk about cover crops yet again. I've been doing it for a long time. We're going to go right to the first slide. The first slide shows you the same picture as we saw on the introductory slide. I did that on purpose because I want you to notice something, a minute detail there. Where the cursor, oops, that was a mistake. Where the cursor is, you notice that this butterfly has got a piece of its wing missing. The term for that is it's been notched. And Butterflies have evolved to make these eyes. They don't do them because they're beautiful, though we sure think they are. They do them because that presents a target for birds. It looks like that's the eye of the organism the bird is trying to feed on, and the bird takes a notch out of the wing, not very nutritious for it, and not vital to the butterfly. And the butterfly lives to pollinate another plant and lay its larva and continue to feed the web of life. And so to me, that is the perfect symbol of the genius of nature. And that is what I want to speak about here. There's a wonderful book called Original Wisdom by Robert Wolf. It's um, stories of ancient ways of knowing. And he, in this book, describes his interactions with the indig indigenous original peoples of Malaysia. And they were not readily willing to talk to him, but he won their trust. And he learned a bunch of wonderful stuff from them, which he shares in this book. What's pertinent to our talk was his description of what happened when government, a government agency asked him, since he actually had some rapport with these indigenous peoples, if, they, if he could try to convince those peoples to work on the rubber plantations. There, you know, I guess it's not that easy to find people that can work in those extremely hot, humid conditions, and they thought these indigenous peoples would be perfect for this. So he said, well, I'll ask, but I'm not optimistic. And he asked them, a, a group of them, and as he said often happens, they were silent. They didn't really respond um, for a while. And then all of a sudden, one person spoke, and he said, that was usually the way. And you could tell that he was speaking for everybody. And he said, we would love to help out, but we've watched these rubber plantations. And we see that they work for the people who are producing rubber. But when they leave them, the jungle doesn't come back. They have changed the land so much that the jungle doesn't come back. And we cannot help to do that because the jungle is our home. It is our source of everything. We cannot help to destroy the jungle. And as Robert Wolf was describing this to the, the agency workers that had tried to get him to recruit these people, they were pretty um, dismissive. Their response was, well, they, they're just lazy, they don't like to work. But there was one scientist um, who was at a desk on the phone, and Robert noticed that that scientist, while he talked, was kind of trying to get off and was paying a lot of attention to what Robert was saying. And Robert got done talking, he was headed out, and the scientist got off the phone and interrupted him and said, what you just said is absolutely right. It is what we are researching right now. We have taken a plot of land, I forget how big it was, but it was a pretty good-sized plot of land, 
And we are cataloging every bit of life on this, on this land, every plant, all the life we can find down to the level of the soil. We can never begin to afford to try to catalog all the life in the soil, but we've taken it down to the soil. And what we found is that they totally understand that the fertility of this jungle is in this life. That is the jungle. The jungle cannot be productive and will not thrive without all of this life. Uh, I just was telling my wife, who introduced me to this book today, uh, that I was going to add this slide and talk about this as kind of an opening um, concept. And she said, yes, and that's what I'm following right now. I wish I could remember the name of the person that she's reading and watching on YouTube right now. But this person is a Native American, and she's speaking to the fact that all over the world, the web of life has gotten very thin. And everybody needs to do everything they can to reweave the web of life. And cover crops are an incredible tool for that. They are mimicking nature. They're major diversity. They're massively productive. As we're going to see, they're producing fertility above ground and below ground. They're having all kinds of positive other impacts. They're m totally nurturing, giving sustenance and arborage to all kinds of beneficial life that, the, that our farm needs, though sometimes we don't even think of all of that life as beneficial. Some parts of it we might think are pests, but the reality is we need all of that life, and cover crops are a pathway to that. And so that's the ancient wisdom that I hope that we can relearn um, and rededicate ourselves to tonight. Cover crops provide solar-powered fertility. None of us would be eating if it wasn't for cover crops. All of life, except for, I guess, someplace deep, deep down in the ocean next to a few volcanic fissures, there is some other life that doesn't use solar energy. But that's, you know, it's using the heat from the earth instead. But the rest of us are all eating because of solar energy. And we all see what solar energy makes above ground. We see the plants, we see the trees, we see the incredible power of plant life that is fueled by our sun, which is this massive source of wealth for all of us. But below ground, those same plants are pumping exudates into the soil. 50 to 80 percent of everything that plants produce above ground, as far as nutrients, is pumped below the soil and exuded 30 to 50 percent of what comes from solar, from photosynthesis from most plants, 30 to 50 percent is exuded into the soil by those plants to feed the microbial communities that work in mutuality with those plants, providing water, protection from pathogens, and access to minerals that the plants couldn't otherwise access. And so that's an incredible donation to all of us that we all would not be able to thrive without, which is a solar energy. Protection from the elements. If you look at soil that is covered with plants and soil that's not covered with plants, especially if it has clay in it, but even if not, pounding rains, baking sun, powerful, powerful hail, wind, all of those things are eroding and degrading so, sun, soil if it is not protected by plants. Weed suppression, we're going to talk a lot about that tonight. Cover crops are probably the number one tool that organic farmers can use to to break the weed cycle on their plants. That and the integration of animals together are probably the, our best chance at solving what's probably one of the biggest problems for organic and regenerative farmers and, and backyard gardeners, too. Um, water retention. We brought Gabe Brown to speak here about, I guess it's now four years ago, quite a while ago. And one of the incredible facts that I used to promote promote his, his um, talk and get people to come was the fact that when Gabe Brown realized he had no choice but to go with working with nature and stop trying to make the land do what he wanted it to do, but rather to do what it wanted it to do, he went to multi-species cover crops and the integration of animals with multi-species cover crops in order to protect his soil, gain the nutrients he needed so that he could grow his crops. He had really had enough climate-based disasters that he wasn't bankable anymore. He couldn't get loans. His only way he could keep going was to use that one source of wealth that bankers have no control over, and that's the sun. And 
basically over the course of eight years, I think it was, maybe it was longer than that. Anyways, I have eight in my head because that's what the figure I'm going to give in a moment. He took soil that it, when he started could not absorb more than a half an inch per hour, per hour of rain. And by creating this incredibly alive soil with this incredible soil carbon sponge, he brought his soil to a point where he could gain eight inches of rain every hour. Folks, that has to happen everywhere as we deal with the inevitable effects of climate change right now. Hopefully we can slow them and eventually reverse them. But right now the oceans are warmer and their air is warmer and there's way more water in the air and way more of it's coming down. We're seeing that in the news all the time. Our farm here in North Carolina, we lost 70% of our farm uh, to Fred, the Tropical Depression Fred this, this fall. And we've seen more major water events in the last 10 years than we'd seen in the last 20 years before that. So it's very important that we increase the capacity of the soil to retain water. Soil structure and enhancement via exudates and the residues. So you have, these, you have plants pumping exudates in the soil to feed their microbial community. And at the same time, they are shedding leaves or when they're finished, we're killing them in some way. We try not to incorporate them because we want that protection on top, but we're killing them. And those residues are becoming part of the soil carbon sponge. They're being turned into humus or other soil aggregates with the help of largely fungi. And then there's serendipitous harvest. Turns out that a bunch of our cover crops and a bunch of new ones that I want us to think about, potential cover crops, have aspects of them that are very nutritious for us and oftentimes quite tasty. It's not like you're going to make your living on your cover crops, but you might get to eat a bunch from them and you might find an occasional crop that you can actually take to market and sell. And then finally, natural air conditioning via respiration. I want to recommend Walter Yenne, and I have a link at the end to one of his videos. Walter Yenne is talking about the fact that we are at a stage right now where climate catastrophe is happening. It's, there's no way to avoid that. We can definitely mitigate it. It's not hopeless, but we've got to get going on it. And we're kind of missing a big piece of it. There's a major focus on fossil fuels. And fossil fuels are an important piece because they are that greenhouse that's holding the heat in. But global warming was happening prior to industrialization. Not as quickly, but it was happening prior to industrialization because of humanity's incredible tendency to defoliate the planet, to cut down forests, to, you know, it, it's kind of classic that Greece has become a, a deforested land because of people over harvesting um, trees for various state purposes and that's, you can see that everywhere all over the world and we have to reverse that. Walter Yenne does an incredible job of explaining why to you about that, why that's important, but he makes the point that 5% of the heat dynamics on the planet are affected by fossil fuels and the greenhouse gas effect that fossil fuels cause. The other 95% are, the direct relation, relate, are directly related to hydrological systems, to the, the retention of water and the movement of water in plants and in the soil. Plants help to create the soil carbon sponge which holds water and Plants are respiring. And when he said that, I remembered a figure which I have to chase down again. I know I read it in a from a reputable source, so it's probably true. Maybe it's apocryphal, but anyways, from what I read a long time ago, a, a huge healthy hemlock here, here in the southeast of the United States, hemlock conifer, it's a conifer tree, will produce or respirate rather up to 40,000 gallons of water on a hot summer day. Right? That hemlocks are critical to our mountain environments because by doing that they're keeping the mountain streams cool. That's why we have the trout. There's a whole lot of our ecology that depends on hemlocks. Okay, in a recent video of Walter Yenes that I was watching, he put out the figure that a gallon of respired water provides puts out in the process of respiring 600 calories. 
So 600 calories are being pumped into the air, not retained, right? And that is cool, that's a cooling process. If you multiply 600 times 40,000 gallons, I think that's about 24 million calories a day that one hemlock tree is cooling the planet by. Now, it's more complex than that because water vapor is also a greenhouse gas. So it's not like you're directly getting that much cooling, but there is still a net gain in cooling from every plant that's growing. And indeed, of course, it's also covering that soil, and soil's very good at retaining heat. So those plants are better at keeping the soil cool, which is also important for our crops. So we want to grow them every which way we can. Okay. Basically, regenerative, the regenerative agriculture vision is solar powered. The brilliant and dynamically, dynamically interactive living architecture of plants ensures maximum solar energy is delivered to the soil food web through exudates. Um, and here's just one picture. There's, if you look closely in here, there's buckwheat, there's sudex, there's sun hemp, there's cow peas. There's just a, a wonderful array. And you can see there, you can't see the ground. Basically, this architecture is capturing every bit of solar power. And that is the goal we want. That's what jungles do. That's why the indigenous peoples of Malaysia didn't want the jungle to be turned into a monocrop with exposed soil, with the inability to capture every bit of solar power we can get. OK, this is the old way. This is a pretty old picture. And this is the way I used to do it. I used to grow cover crops. That's rye on the left. I'd work them in. I'd plant my crops. And you know, they did darn well. I was pretty proud of myself. And then I learned. I learned to add some legumes. I learned, which we're going to see in the next slide. No, we're not. We're going to see first that one of the other things that cover crops do is act as subsoilers. And at Living Web Farms, we had a new greenhouse. The greenhouse had been constructed without leveling or the site for the, for the greenhouse, the foundation, had been constructed without leveling the site, which was an incredible mistake. Um, and we had to level it, but when we had to level it, we had to do it by moving soil around, and that caused pretty major compaction. And we resolved that problem with cover crops. We basically used cover crops as subsoilers. We Particularly focused on, though there's some other cover crops in there, you can see a lot of what are radish leaves, the kind of broader leaves there are radish leaves. We use tillage radish, also known as oilseed radish, um, or forage radish. It's basically a big daikon. You can eat it just like a daikon. It can get huge. I've seen them get the size of a, of a, of a person's thigh and just go incredibly deep and really work the soil pretty wonderfully. And then we have... Uh, Another crop that we're going to talk a bunch about tonight, and that's Phacelia tanacetifolia, also known as tansy leaf Phacelia. That's a member of the borage and comfrey family, and that family is a family of dynamic accumulators. They're very good at going really deep and pulling all kinds of nutrients in. And so fringe Phacelia, Phacelia tanacetifolia, whatever you want to call it, is one of those soil openers and dynamic accumulators. The other one that we use is rye, cereal rye, the winter rye grain. It's also very good at opening up the soil. There are other ones we could have used. Fava beans are really good at that. Um, in the summertime, sudex is particularly good if you cut it back. People let sudex grow six, six feet tall, then cut it back. They could do that sometimes twice in the summer. It's so vigorous. Every time it, you cut it, it first sends its roots down deeper before it goes back up. So it really helps to open the soil. And there's the Phacelia, another picture of the incredible architecture of natural systems. This is a, a maturing winter cover crop. You've got winter peas right there. You have the Phacelia in bloom. By the way, people warn people growing this cover crop that you want to be sure that it is finished flowering or you terminate its flowering before you need another crop to be pollinate it because it is so attractive to pollinators that you may get less pollinating action on crops that you're hoping would pollinate it. And then there's also rye, and if we look deeper, we'd see other cover crops too. There's about probably six different cover crops that are growing in this picture. And then here's just a big field of cover crop. This is at Grandview, one of our farms. 
and you can just see the incredible biomass that's there. And you can imagine how that soil is not getting as hot as it would if it was bare soil. By the way, if you look up maps of uh, climate change maps that show the level of greenhouse gases in the air, the amount of heat held, it actually gets much worse in the winter in where, where it's winter and trees and plants are going dormant because the trees and plants are actually holding a whole lot of that carbon in themselves along with doing the cooling that they're doing. So winter is actually a time for greater solar gain for us than summer. We actually get less gain of, of heat in the summer. Okay, so the collective genius of regenerative farming, of the regenerative farming community, has transformed how we relate to cover crops. Uh, in the 20th century, and once again, I, I made this kind of a sharper, um, a sharper divide than it actually was. I actually did learn some things about the things I'm going to talk about on the right side in the late 90s, but for most of the, of the latter part of the, of the 20th century, we read about and thought about cover crops as green manures. They basically were called cover crops because they covered fallow fields, and they did the things I talked about right off at the beginning. They protected those fallow fields from rain, from wind. Um, they also created biomass and fixed nitrogen for the next crops, and it was, we thought that was pretty important. It was a, a major thing to grow cover crops. And if you were being an organic grower, you were not being a good organic grower if you weren't figuring out how to incorporate cover crops. But in the 21st century, we realized what dynamos these cover crops were. Um, sure, they afforded the vital benefits discerned in the 20th century, but they could also, we realized, be grown as mulch that was in place for no-till systems. We could grow the large amounts of biomass you've seen in the pictures I've already shown you of cover crops, and you could roll them down, or less good, but still good enough, flail mow those to kill them. You have to have a way to terminate them, but once you terminate them, you have large amounts of organic matter that are on top of the soil that you can plant through, and the weeds don't have the light to germinate, and the moisture gets held in by those cover crops. So that's a, a major benefit that we hadn't really been using as much. There was, like I said, it wasn't as, as evenly divided as I make out in the slides. In the late 90s, there was a researcher, I think he was in Pennsylvania, who made a real big deal of, and got a lot of attention for developing a tomato system where he grew abundant, rich crops of vetch and then mowed them at the base so that they just dropped and really mulched tomato patches. And then as they rotted, they fed the tomatoes. And he got great productivity there. So it's not like we immediately made this transition as soon as the 21st century happened. But we're headed that way, and it's all come more to fruition here in this, this century. Okay, they also provide critical biodiverse habitat for beneficial insects and other life. And I want to really emphasize the other life. They, they, they advertise, they, cover crops provide harborage and nu nutrition for all kinds of life, and we want all of that life, even though sometimes we think some of that life is quite bothersome. Indeed, I'm not a big fan of groundhogs on the farm, but I recognize their ecological place, and I'm okay with the fact that sometimes the groundhogs are eating my cover crops. If I can get them to eat those and not the crops, I'm pretty happy. Um, cover crops also can provide high-quality animal forage, and we've done some with that. Our farm in Florida has done much more with that. We've literally sown cover crops into pastures to improve the pastures, and the animals can both eat the cover crops and the pasture. And then, as you'll see, this year we've moved more towards integrating those animals into our larger farm operation, our north farm. Okay. And finally, cover crops offer a natural alternative to herbicides. They basically provide competition, and there's a, a phenomena we call allelopathy, whereby they exude germination and growth inhibiting exudates. Um, they exude exudates, right? Basically, their roots are pumping out stuff that gives them an advantage over other plants. Rye is pretty famous for that, and really the one that is most powerful is Sudex. Sudex uh, which is a hybrid of sorghum and sedan grass, is a favorite of farmers for its incredible ability to build biomass and, I just, as I just described, go down deep and open up the soil. But one of the other things it does is when you kill it, the residue and what it, what, what it has been pumping into the soil makes it much harder for other plants to germinate. 
And we had that really graphically shown to us one year when we had a huge crop of basically multi-species cover crops in the greenhouse that I just showed you where we are growing the cover crops to open up the soil, the new greenhouse. And we basically came in there and flail mowed it. And then to prepare a seed bed, we were going to direct seed. We flail mowed it in September. And I said, let's try just piling straw. We had straw piled up from other uses on top of these beds and let the straw encourage the life to come up and devour these cover crops. You know, he said, if things go well, we should have a perfect seed bed. And we did. We pulled that straw off about the middle of November, about two months later, and there was just this fine layer of decomposed cover crop. And we planted into that. And I, I actually wasn't getting to do it myself, but I asked my coworkers to water it and give it a week and then flame any weeds, because we were going to be planting carrots and beets and onions, things that are slow germinators and that can really have the weeds get ahead of them and make, make them very hard to grow. And I was busy working on um, presentations, couldn't get to do it myself, but I checked in with my coworkers and said, did you flame? And they said, Pat, there were no weeds, we didn't need to. I'm like, oh, great. Actually, it wasn't great at all. We then seeded the cover crops and we got horrible germination. We just, I, I think the carrots barely came up at all. The beets were terrible. Oh, turnips was the other one. Turnips did pretty well. They came up despite it. And the next summer, Ron Morris was presenting here. We have, I want you to see that, that video series that we have. Um, and he spoke to the fact that, he, as far as he could tell, Sudex was the most aleopathic um, cover crop that he had ever grown. And he spoke to the fact that usually that phenomenon just causes seeds not to germinate, that if you put weak seedlings into freshly incorporated Sudex, it would actually kill them. Now, that can be an, this can be an advantage if you time it right. So it's not that it's bad, but you have to understand the phenomena. And indeed, about four or five weeks after our germination wasn't good, we started getting much more germination because the effect had worn off. So you just want to time when that happens and make sure you do it in a way. Or if you're planting healthy, big, vigorous transplants in, this effect can be very, very positive. And we've had a lot of, of good effect when we're doing transplants. Okay, in the latter part of, our, of the 20th century, our approach to cover crops was pretty transactional. By that I mean you would look at you know, what cover crop you're growing and you'd see how many pounds of nitrogen it fixed and how much biomass you got. And that's what you're growing it for. You weren't really thinking about, I'm growing a plant community, uh, I'm growing communities of plants that are about maximizing the life in mutuality. And that is kind of the concept that I was trying to get across when I was first talking about original wisdom. And so, you know, it was pretty cutting edge in the, in the 20th century. Um, it was a best practice to include combinations of grains and legumes. I first learned about this from Keith Baldwin, a now retired wonderful extension agent um, and educator. And he explained to me that if you grow a cover crop with a grain, the grain is very good at scavenging the nitrogen that's available in the soil. The cover crop, the, the, the legume, I said if you grow, I said if you grow a cover crop, if you grow a grain with a legume, basically the grain is going to quickly take up nitrogen and it's going to get all the nitrogen it can and that is going to make the, the legume have to fix more nitrogen. The legume won't fix nitrogen if it doesn't need to. And of course it fixes it in those little nodules. I think we actually didn't look at that picture. Maybe we should go back for a second for somebody that hasn't looked at it. Right here, these are the nodules I'm talking about, and they're on most legumes. Doesn't mean they're not, the legume isn't going to fix nitrogen if they don't have these, but by and large, they're on most legumes, and they have a rhizobia bacteria that they are feeding that lives in these nodules, and basically those bacteria are very good at fixing nitrogen from the air. I don't think it's accidental that nitrogen is such a huge piece of fertility for plants, given that it is the most abundant element we have in the air. It's about, our, our atmosphere is about 78% nitrogen. So having legumes that fix that nitrogen is a big deal. And by the way, if you don't have the bacteria, nobody's home, those nodules will not fix nitrogen. You can tell if you have the right life 
bacteria, rhizobia bacteria in these nodules by cutting one open with your fingernail. And if it's reddish brown or pinkish, that means that the bacteria is there. If it's white, that means nobody's home and you need to inoculate next time. Okay, so we knew that by combining legumes with grains, we cause the legumes to fix far more nitrogen than they would if we just grew legumes. And of course, we wouldn't be fixing any nitrogen if we just grew grains. Though we would, and this is important to remember, still have those grains scavenging for nitrogen that might move out of the rhizosphere, rhizosphere the, roots, the root zone, if we didn't have these fast-growing grains to go ahead and scavenge up and hold all those nutrients. And not just nitrogen, but phosphorus and potassium and other nutrients. But meanwhile, having the rhizobia bacteria actually fix more nitrogen because it needs it too, and it's not as good at getting it from the soil because it doesn't need to be, means that you have a more dynamic situation. And of course, once again, the results from this combination were measured in pounds of nitrogen and biomass per acre. And those are really good things. We don't want to say they're not. Um, but the benefits of our 21st century multi-species cocktails, and Ray Archuleta, and I think we have his link to his talk that he gave here with David Brand and Jay Brand, Brandt, um, was a person who really introduced the concept of cocktails. Once again, I, make, I talk about it like it happened 20th century and then it changed in the 21st century. I was drifting towards cocktails um, in the latter part of the 90s. I was, incur I was growing two or three different cover crops at a time, maybe even four, but I wasn't at six or seven or eight. Um, and when I first heard, heard of Ray Archuleta, I heard about him for a long time before I actually heard him. And it was from people really enthusiastic about the impacts they were seeing from ramping up the, the diversity, the biodiversity. When you think about it, the more diversity of plants that you grow, especially since almost all of these plants are taking solar energy and pumping exudates into the soil to feed the microbial community, you're gonna have a, a much more diverse, healthy community if you have a diverse, a diverse array of plants doing that. To say nothing of having all these plants, as we've already shown, having different architecture to maximize solar, solar collection. Okay. So yeah, the solar efficiency of combinations often results in excellent nitrogen and biomass production. But the impact of abundant soil exudates, diverse soil exudates, produced by such cocktails, create a vigor and resilience in the soil food web that is probably more important than just having more nitrogen and having more biomass though it's, to be fair, not nearly as easy to measure. Um, so basically I wanna give a big pitch for the link up here. That's to the SARE book, which you can download as a PDF or you can buy, it's pretty reasonably priced. Um, and it's managing cover crops profitably. What's interesting is I have been recommending this book since the 90s. I mean, I, when I got this book, I just sat down and read it from cover to cover. I haven't looked at it since then. And of course, they've been updating it. And indeed, I've told people, it doesn't really talk about, about a lot of the new cover crops. I'm wrong about that, it does. I just wasn't reading it, again, looking at the latest edition. So it's in its third edition now, and a lot of the cover crops I talk about are now covered in the book when they weren't at first. Indeed, when I pulled it up to get a link and put it on here, I started reading it, and I had to stop myself and get back to work on my PowerPoint because there's a bunch of stuff that's new in there that I wanna read. Um, and I looked up one thing I wanted to find and there was some new information which I'm looking forward to sharing with you. It's a wonderful book. I highly recommend it. You can get it for free or you can buy it for not much money. And it's put out by SARE, um, which is a government agency um, and which provides grants and con run sponsors conferences. Indeed, we have a link to another conference that I took part in that was sponsored by SARE. It's a really great organization and I recommend following them. Okay, so in the 20th century, it wasn't like we only had one or two cover crops. We had quite a few that we used. Rye has always been a star. Um, and actually, at that point, managing cover crops properly said for the southeast, where we are, that the king and queen of cover crops for biomass production were rye and hairy vetch. Um, and I think that's true, though we don't grow hairy vetch at all anymore, and I'll explain why in a little bit. But they're a highly, highly productive combination. Also, wheat, barley, oats, all of those were being used in the 90s for various reasons. 
Oats are particularly interesting because a whole lot of us wanted to use them to winter kill, and they theori theoretically do winter kill, and apparently they absolutely do further north. But here in the mountains of North Carolina, um, as, a, as a, a cover crop expert from the extension office said to me, Pat, when you want them to die, they live. When you want them to live, they die. And that's kind of true here. It's not, they're not as reliable here. It'd be great if they did reliably winter kill. But they're still a really good and much easier to kill cover crop. And they have the added advantage, and I'm going to speak to this often, of creating another product. If you're an herbalist and you're growing oats, you can let them go to seed. And as you come to the milky oat stage, when you take a grain and puncture it with your nail, and a white milk comes out, right? At that stage, you can harvest those oats and make a tincture that makes an incredible nervine. That is an herbal remedy that nourishes the, the um, nervous system. And I've made that and shared it with people that had various needs. I'm not going to do a, a, a talk about herbal, herbal products right now, but it makes a wonderful tincture. And if you're growing a cover crop, you can make a lot of milky oat tincture. I one year made so much that I gave it away as party favors at our Christmas party. Um, so that's an added advantage. Buckwheat, buckwheat uh, for me in the 90s was like my go-to summer cover crop. And it also had the added advantage of being a wonderful insectary. It really produced tons of nectar and pollen for the beneficial insects. Indeed, I had a neighbor one time kind of jokingly but kind of seriously chide me for having it in bloom when the um, sourwood was in bloom, because sourwood is famous for this light, delicate honey. And if the bees are getting buckwheat and, sou and sourwood nectar at the same time, they weren't going to have that wonderful sourwood honey. Um, but the bees don't mind, and I sure didn't mind as far as the productivity went. And then finally, the gooms of the, of the 20th century were largely hairy vetch, crimson clover, and winter peas. I used to say always Austrian winter peas, but I noticed that lots of times now, anyways, it just says peas. It doesn't say Austrian winter peas. Um, and then finally, white and red clover. Nowadays, you know, that was starting to change in the late 90s, and by now, there's a whole bunch of other ones. Um, so we have grains and other non-leguminous cover crops that are new, Newish, they're about 15, 20 years old now. Tillage radish is huge. Goes by a couple other names. Oilseed radish or forage radish. I've already described it kind of. And then this is the computer thinking it knows them more than I do. This is supposed to be tansy leaf phacelia, but it's, it comes out as tansy phacelia. Do not grow tansy as a cover crop. It's a perennial, it's a persistent perennial. It'll cause you problems. It's a great beneficial insect plant, um, it has many other values, but it is not a cover crop. That's supposed to say tansy-leaved phacelia. Okay, and then kale. We actually used to grow kale in the summertime, and I think we might get back to that, and I'll talk about that a little later. But we stopped because it became an arborage for harlequin bugs. But we try to, encourage, in, to include it in our winter crops, along with forage turnip and oilseed radish. All, all of that family are really good for making biomass, creating diversity. If you use the cover crops for forage, they're excellent forage. Um, so kale's a good one. And we're going to get into two, like another whole concept, which I'll cover later, the way these cover crops nourish our beneficial insects, which then help to control uh, what we consider to be pests. Though actually, that's a, that's a, a paradigm that I don't really want to encourage. Okay, so then... The grains that are kind of new are sorghum, sudex, uh, which is, like, like I said, a hybrid of sorghum and sedan grass. Sunflowers, which is really wonderful because you can have them in bloom and they're so much fun to see. And then the birds love to eat the flowers too. And then um, the legumes, yellow or sweet clover, which is a biennial, so you got to plant it that way if you want to get the full nitrogen benefit. Bird's foot clover, which is a perennial but not that hard to kill and really good for wet areas. Um, soybeans, which my coworkers have been a little bit um, reticent to grow that because the deer like it so much. But I've pointed out to them that the deer tend not to hit it nearly as hard when it's mixed into this incredible, incredible diversity of cover crops. Um, if you grow it straight onto itself, you can get hit pretty hard by deer. They really love soybeans. Sun hemp, this is a very 
fascinating cover crop that I was totally mis misled by the knowledge I had in the 90s. I was wanting to explore it, but I heard, I read that it was illegal to grow. And then at a SARE sponsored cover crop conference with a bunch of extension agents from all over the United States, um, Stuart Weiss was with me. He's an extension agent in the Virgin Islands. And I said, what's that plant? That plant's like none I've ever seen. And he said, oh, that's another crotalaria. Okay, and crotalaria is the Latin name for sun hemp. I'm like, wait a minute. Is that the, is that the one that's illegal? And he said, exactly. It's not at all like sun hemp. It grows low to the ground. It's got, I think, pretty nasty spines. It grows like crazy. It's toxic to, to um, cattle and other, other um, grazing animals. And that was the one that was illegal. So make sure if you're growing a crotal area that you grow sun hemp. I kind of knew that it was going to be okay to grow sun hemp because even as I was reading that it was illegal, a lot of extension agent people and the people at the Center for Environmental Farming Systems were busy doing experiments with it. So I figured if they can do it, I can do it. Cow peas. Cow peas are a really impressive cover crop. There's two kinds. One is a combination of vining, or no, there's, there's, a, there's a famous combination of the two kinds. That's called iron and clay. But the kind that often is grown a lot of is the vining indeterminate one. That'll give you the most biomass. The thing is, if you're trying to grow it amongst your crops, it can get pretty, pretty unruly. So I don't recommend it. If you're growing cow peas amongst your crops and you want them to die pretty easily, then you want to grow a determinant cow pea. And the one that I remember the name of, though I've certainly heard other ones, but one that we locally can buy is called Red Ripper. The common combination that uses a cover crop oftentimes is called iron and clay. And one of, one of them, either the iron or the clay, is a determinant, and one is an indeterminate. And the combination gives you that dense architecture that we're talking about that captures more sunlight. So the determinant one is bigger and taller, and the vining one can grow up on it and gives you more biomass. But you don't want to use that if you're trying to grow it, let's say, in a grow zone for plants because it's, it's going to vine off to the side and cause you all kinds of problems. One that isn't as commonly used as a cover crop here that I've experimented with but not enough and I want to do more with is fava beans. Fava beans are one of my favorite vegetable crops and they're the only bean that we grow in cold weather. They're actually not a bean, they're actually a vetch. And they have many, many beneficial aspects, but there's a, a bunch of them that are smaller seeded that you can grow as a cover crop. They're often called broad beans instead of fava beans. And then Lab Lab. Lab Lab, I got turned on to by Mark Schoenbeck. It's also known as purple hyacinth bean. It's really lovely. It's not easy to find. If you want to try it, the company I found that could get it for me was called Kaufman Seed. I haven't bought from them for a long time. They're out in the Midwest, but they're real good at finding unusual cover crop seeds. They're not good at remembering that you don't want treated seeds. So you want to emphasize that. Make sure it's written on the invoice. I one time had to send about three bags of cover crop seed back because they were treated with fungicide, which of course, as an organic grower, I can't use. Um, what Mark loved about Lab Lab was the way it grew its mat, which makes this large, large, heavily vining mat of, um, of foliage. It suppressed everything else, and when you removed it, you had a ready-to-plant bed. So those are the, the new cover crops compared to the 20th century cover crops. Okay. So the more species you pick, the more productivity, right? That's the whole idea of these cocktails. But you want to consider some things, right? And a major thing to consider is how long to maturity, because basically it's very hard to kill anything before it goes to seed because that is the purpose of plants. And they're going to put everything they can into staying alive until they start to make seed. Then they become much more vulnerable because all of their energy is in seed production and their root systems and their stems are easier to permanently kill. And that's why we have a roller crimper because when you roll it, it might still pop back up, but that crimper breaks that brittle seed stalk and then the plant dies. So getting crops that will die that will, that will senesce, go to seed quickly enough to fit our schedules is pretty important. And we'll talk about that more in a minute. Um, we are in the mountains of North Carolina. We have a lot of really cool, moist weather. And I'm going to describe more how two different Mays had diametrically different impacts on our, on our no-till farming plans. When it's cool and moist, 
our no-till systems do not work well at all. When it's hot and dry, the year of 2019, I like to say that May was like August and June was like April. And that totally worked for us. That worked for us except for one, in one way, which I'll describe a little later. But why it works so well for us is our biomass of winter cover crops, which looked a lot like that um, picture I showed you with the phacelia in there, was all, because of the heat, senescing, going to seed, and when we rolled it down, because it was so hot, it didn't have a chance. It all died and quickly dried and became this thick biomass that was going to stay there. Literally, I have a picture, which I didn't include because you can only put so many slides in a talk. That thick biomass was still there and still suppressing weeds in late October. And that was a, a huge benefit for us. In May of 2020, it was wet and cool. And when we rolled down our cover crop, rather than drying, it all just rotted. And then wet and cool favors the growth of grasses. And I call, I call 2020 our grasses disaster year. It was just impossible to control the grasses. Um, and I really want to thank our interns of that year because they, incredibly good natured, did far more weeding than we represented to them they would have to do. They're basing how much weeding they'd have to do on a few years of successful no-till. And our system crashed and burned because of not cooperative weather in 2020. Okay, in our climate, vetch is problematic. We are trying to get rid of vetch, and it's not easy. Vetch is famous for having hard seed that will stay alive in the soil for up to 15 years, and it just keeps coming and coming. I think we finally have found a solution for it, but it's been driving us nuts because vetch does not want to die unless it's brutally hot. And we've had several years where we can kill everything else, but we can't kill the vetch. We don't plant it anymore, but it's coming on endlessly from years before when we did plant it and didn't know to control it. If you're tilling, it's no problem, and we used to till. So we didn't worry about it, because you could always kill it. It dies immediately from being tilled. If you flail mow, you can kill it, but we want to roll our cover crop. Why rolling is superior to flail mowing, though flail mowing is very effective, and a lot of people have flail mowers and think that's just as good. It's kind of just as good except for one thing. If you flail mowed that same cover crop in 2019 that I said was still there, suppressing weeds and protecting the soil four months later, four and a half months later, it would be gone in our nice live soil that's full of life that can digest readily available nutrients. It would be gone in less than a month. So it would be protecting our young seedlings, but then our soil would be bare again. And you can work with that if you don't have a roller crimper and you only have a flail mower. You just have to know that as that short-term cover is rotting away, or even before it's completely rotted, you've got to sow your next understory cover crop to provide the same kind of protection and weed suppression that you're getting from your biomass. Okay, so for us, we've had so many years where we, we would have a hot week, we'd roll our vetch, it was dying, and then it would cool off and start raining, and we'd see this dead cover crop just kind of tilt up and start growing again. And it would just drive us nuts. So we really don't want to have vetch anymore. Um, but we've got it. Now, that's too bad because vetch has got tons of good qualities. As I said, in the, in the last part of the 20th century, growing, growing, managing cover crops profitably called it the king and queen of biomass producers for the winter season, by the way, in the southeast. And we discovered that to be true. So the one new thing, a bit of information I allowed myself to glean from managing cover crops prof profitably, the third edition that I just pulled up for you all to be able to access, was that plant breeders are working with farmers who have talked about this problem of vetch taking too long to senesce and not being able to get it killed soon enough, or at all in our case. And they have developed a new variety. I say new, it's now about 15 years old, but I'm just learning about it. And that's called purple bounty. And apparently that is a much shorter season vetch so that it is going to flower and in full senescence so that it's easier to kill well before, which is kind of the drop dead planting time for most of us in the southeast, I think is going to be sometime in April or May, depending on where you are in the flatlands closer to the ocean. It's probably in April. For us, it's in May. Um, and your, your hairy vetch is going to start going to seed then, but if the weather's not good, it won't go to seed enough. So hopefully this 
purple bounty will be much further along and easier to kill at that point. The problem for us still is that oftentimes, unless you're flailing, even if you manage to somewhat kill the vetch, it still may, by the time you got it mature enough to die, it may already be setting seed. And I don't know if you've all noticed that, but plants don't die when we think we've killed them. They live for as long as they can to do one thing, reproduce. So a famous example would be, go ahead and pull what's called pigweed or um, amaranth out of the soil and drop it in your path. And now if, you don't, if you're not careful when it rains, it'll just re-root and start growing right away. But even if you get it to die, you will see that this plant that hadn't yet made seed actually still gets to set seed because it draws its life from what's a very big, robust plant from the leaves, from the stems, from everywhere, and it still sets seeds. And that can also happen with vetch. You can roll it down, have it so that it's dead, and there are pods on there that aren't fully developed, and yet they'll still develop and make seed. It won't be as good as seed, but it'll be good enough to drive you nuts. So you want to be careful with vetch. Um, sun hemp, by the way, is my favorite legume for being certain of being able to kill it. I've never seen it live from being rolled. When you roll it, it doesn't crimp, it breaks off, and it's dead. It's got a disadvantage in that it's got a very lignous or woody stem. So you have to work with that. It's not like that doesn't rot pretty quickly. It actually, it's got a lot of advantages. It'll stick around. If you grow it in the right place, it'll stick around and help to suppress weeds and slowly release nutrients. But it's the best one for dying, and there's variations between all those. Um, anyways, the persistence or lack thereof of residue is something we want to think about too. So cover crops like um, grains or the sun hemp are high in lignin and their stems when you roll them down and they dry, if they do dry, now if it's like May in 2020, wet and cool, even they're going to rot on you. But if you can get them to you know, dry out, they will last a long time. So my goal is to set up a, a zoned planting season. I want to have the high lignin cover crops growing adjacent to where I'm putting my plants. I learned this from Ron, from Ron Morris and we have a great video um, which we have a link to here in this talk and that's what he taught me to do, to grow cover crops that are persistent once you knock them down or even some like Sudex won't even die, grow those in the adjacent areas, the lanes and the immediately adjacent part of the beds to where you have your planting zone. And in your planting zone, grow legumes that are high in nitrogen but easy to kill. Things like cow peas, things like crimson clover, things like peas, um, fava beans, those kinds of plants. And they're succulent, so if you come through at your no-till um, planter, they're going to be chopped up by the disc that first chops them up, and then they're going to be busted up and pulled out by the ripper that opens up your planting hole, and they're going to die, and they're going to rot quickly and release nutrients to the crop you're planting. So basically, I'm recommending that you put those kinds of more succulent crops, such as cow peas, mustard, winter peas, fava beans, and other plants like that in the grow zone, and then have on the outer edge and in the lanes wherever you're growing cover crops, have those consist of a bunch of the more lignous ones. Not that you wouldn't grow some of these other plants with them, but you'd want to have enough of the highly lignous ones to give you enough residue to get it to stick around. One that we didn't get to try this year, we're going to experiment with next year is flax. Flax, of course, is a famous um, fiber plant and the highest source of plant available omega-3 fatty acids, but not the most readily available source. We'll get to that one. But I want to grow it as a source of high lignin biomass. And so we'll play with that for next year. Okay. All right. So excuse me while I kvetch about hairy vetch. It, I already talked about it some. It's driven me quite nuts. I've had a hard time killing it everywhere that I've wanted to have it die in early May when the weather's wrong and it won't die. But I did have the pleasure of having every resource I needed to make it work wonderfully. And that was at this community garden that I managed for a high-end development, Mountaineer. Um, and they had a huge resource, which we took advantage of fully. They collected the leaves from all these lawns and brought us literally hundreds of yards of leaves, which we had no place to put them except for in what were deep paths around our beds. And we would come, we would have a work day 
maybe even rent like a, a power, a power um, wheelbarrow where it's the only thing you could fit in the little garden gate. And we would move hundreds and hundreds of yards of leaves into and on top of the beds we didn't have cover crops on, but we mostly had cover crops on the beds unless they were growing some perennials for the members in their, in their gar in the little garden beds. But we would basically stomp the leaves in the paths adjacent to the beds. And that was a couple weeks process. They, it was quite a mess and unruly for a couple weeks while we got them really packed in. Then they would rot down, they make wonderful amendment for the soil. That soil was subsoil when we first started and it was black and rich when I left after about seven years. Um, but the other advantage was that we could come in in February or March and mow this incredible mass of vetch that would not die if we wanted to try and kill it, right? Until it was going to seed, which is too late, sometime in May. We could come in and cut it to the ground. They call that scalping, right? Just scalp it to the ground, let the, the, as much of the residue as it could drop right on the bed, and then take a bunch of those rotting leaves, which are now quite thick and heavy because they've been sitting all winter in the paths, right? And pile those on top. And that would kill anything. It would kill rye, it would kill vetch, everything died. And then this worked fine because the way that resort works is these are second homes. People don't come up until the weather's good. So they wouldn't come up until late April or early May to start gardening. And at that point, we could just come in and pull those leaves off and all of this residue has rotted down and made a wonderful planting bed. And there were no weeds and it was easy to plant. So it can work if you do that. And I, that's one way I recommend for a lot of small growers. Um, if you don't have a tractor and you want to get your bed ready early, if you want to start planting in, let's say, April, this isn't going to work for trying to plant in February or March. But if you want to plant, let's say, in April, you can get out there in the end of January or middle of January and just take a bunch of leaves or some other heavy mulch. And now silage tarps are used this way. But I think Silage tarps aren't as fast as the leaves or heavy mulch because they they're not weighing down and pressing that material into the ground. They're, they allow more air. So I think the, the rotting is not as quick. But silage tarps are used this way too to give you a no-till preparation without having to use a no-till planter and a roller crimper and all of that. Not that they even work for something like vetch. Okay. Then I want to say let's think outside the box. You know, and I, I first came to this, this concept when I was asked to visit a uh, regenerative farm op farming operation in Jamaica and help them with some ideas. Um, and that was revelatory to me. It was a joy to work with those people. They are wonderful people and they're incredibly resource challenged. Indeed, they can't afford cover crops. And they really need them now because basically Climate change has resulted in much stronger winds and their crops are being battered by winds and heavy rains to the point where they're thinking of setting up greenhouses in a tropical climate, not obviously to hold heat, but to protect the crops from how harsh the weather is. But I actually had started to go this way as early as the 1998 Organic Growers Conference when I did a cover crop talk. And I was thinking about that cover crop talk right before I gave it and I realized I'm going to put some unusual things in there. So I included two. One that I, my wife was just asking me if I was going to recommend it again and I said, I don't know if I'm going to recommend that one and I'll talk about why in a minute. But one was um, chickweed and the other one was of all things Jerusalem artichokes. Not something most of us, even myself now, would think of as a cover crop. Why I recommended them both is because as a grower, I saw the incredible positive effect they had on the soil. In the places in this really good garden at the Highland Lake Inn where I worked, where the soil was pretty uniform, where there'd been large chickweed patches and where we'd had Jerusalem artichokes for several years, when I worked that soil, it had more aggregation and better tilth than any place else in the garden. So I thought, we want those plants. We want the plants that make the soil better. Um, and I had to come up with a strategy. A lot of people think that you can never get rid of Jerusalem artichokes. And there was a similar strategy to what I just talked about. You would if you were going to grow Jerusalem artichokes, I'd recommend them as a cover crop to tame new land, right? If you get them established, they're going to spread, they're going to be so thick that other, other weeds, things like Johnson grass, are not going to be able to compete. And so over the course of a few years, you could use them to pioneer new land. Now, if you do that, you're not going to get great big wonderful Jerusalem artichokes in the center where you're getting that major weed suppression. 
on the outer edges, you can still dig great artichokes, but basically you're overcrowding the Jerusalem artichokes. The other thing that happens, of course, is when you cut them down, all those stalks are providing great lignus material for fungi and stuff to, to aggregate and make really wonderful soil. The reason why I'm not as enthused about the chickweed now is about the same time I was doing this, our home garden in Celo, North Carolina, had a lot of chickweed, and my wife prevailed, prevailed upon me to leave it all in because she loves it. Well, she couldn't keep up with the volume, and neither could my plants. Chickweed can really, really take over. Not that I'm not going to be talking about some other plants that can do that too, but it's harder to harvest enough of it, and at a certain point, it reaches a point where it's not worth harvesting. It becomes so stemmy. And even though you don't think it's worth harvesting, it's still setting seed like crazy. So it can become a problematic winter weed. I even speak to that problem a little later in the talk. Um, but I want us to think about these crops because they have several advantages. They want to grow. They grow low, right? They're, all of them are edible. I'm going to talk about that a little more in the next talk, next, next slide. But the other reason is when I was there working with Nakruma, who was telling me about how his squash were being battered in, in Jamaica, by these winds, and I could look at it. They were young plants about you know, that long, and the wind was so strong, the vines were just being blown around, being whipped around. How, how well is any plant going to do if they're being battered by those kinds of winds? He said, Pat, if I had cover crops, I could grow them a little further out, and the plant could grab those as they were growing, and they could hold on. But he didn't have cover crops. And I said, Nakruma, we were at market today, and everybody was mad because you all ran out of callaloo. Callaloo is known to us as amaranth, or more commonly in the mountains, as pigweed, or red root. It's a common weed. It's an abundant weed. It's also an incredibly delicious weed, which the people in the, Car in the, Car in the Caribbean are very aware of. They call it callaloo, and it is a number one green. And I said, you can grow more of that. And callaloo, like most of the plants I'm talking about here, makes massive amounts of seed. I just like made it a point to chase down and weigh the amount of seed that our, my coworker Ian collected this year. He wanted to collect, I'm sorry, I said callaloo. That was personally, and I'll get, to, I'll get to that in a minute. Anyways, I recommend a callaloo for him. It makes hundreds of thousands of seeds per plant, and it's small and easy to collect. You don't need a lot of equipment. So I said, you want to just start growing that. For seed, you'll get tons of greens to sell at market. Collect those seeds, plant them where you want then don't let them take over. Whenever they're going to become a problem for your crop, harvest them and take them to market. Get paid to grow your cover crop. And you can afford to do that. You don't need a combine. All you need is a, a good set of screens. You know, I mean, I'm sure you can make them for less. We have a really wonderful set of screens that was donated to us. Um, and we can, we can separate any, any small seed quickly. And why I started talking about purslane is because that's one one of these plants that actually my coworker Ian actually did collect this year. And I called him up and I asked him, I said, how long did it take you to collect what you got? He said, I spent less than two hours on it, Pat. I basically went out in the farm and pulled up the biggest purslanes I could find everywhere, which were pretty huge. I put them in a place where they dry. I came back a couple weeks later. I used our set of screens to separate the seed. I don't think I spent more than an hour and a half at it. Now, it may not look like a lot of seed. The jar was about yay, yay big and about that tall, um, and it was only about two-thirds full, but a, or maybe a third full, I'm sorry. I, I made it a point to weigh it, put it in a different container after I set a tear, and it, that jar contained almost a quarter pound of purslane seed. The seed is tiny, which means, once again, hundreds and hundreds of thousands of seeds in that collection process. It took them and he says no more than an hour and a half for the entire process. So that's possible. We can do that with a bunch of these plants. We can save our old seeds. We can grow them, as we'll talk about in the, ne in the next, um, next slide more. We can sell them. They're food. Um, and they're fast growing and offer alternatives to us for cover crops. I have been trying to get us to put more and more sweet alyssum out to get it to establish. I haven't been very successful. But my coworker Jeremy came to me and said, Pat, I see you doing that all the time. And we haven't really been trying to move that agenda for you. But I just watched a video. And there are these farmers that are growing that as a major understory crop. 
And why do you grow sweet alyssum as an understory crop? Well, it smells wonderful, for one thing. That's called, why it's called sweet alyssum. It's also edible. If you want to bother, the leaves and the flowers are edible. But it's an incredible nectary for beneficial insects. So you grow it under, let's say if you're growing it under tomatoes, it's going to feed the wasps that are then going to parasitize the hornworms in your tomatoes. So that's another reason to grow it. Um, the cresses, there's a bunch of cresses. There's a, a thing called rock cress. I almost stuck a slide of it in there for you, but you can look it up. It's, if you favor that and collect seeds, it'll quickly cover an area. And once again, it's good eaten. It's not very long lived. You'd grow that, a place I might try that in would be after my carrots were up. And my carrots had some decent size on them, but before they were gonna be big enough to canopy, I might plant a, cro a crop of rock cress in there and harvest it out. You know, I wouldn't let it get real big, but it would be actually quite tasty, and that one would be free. The other cresses are two. There's a broadleaf crest you can buy from some seed growers, and then there's one called wrinkled, crinkled, curly crest, um, developed by one of my favorite plant breeders, Frank Morton. Both of those are great crops because they're up. All three of them are up in a matter of days and will quickly provide a quick crop for you. You can cut them a couple times, and they'll have been suppressing the weeds all that time. They're not going to be there all summer. You probably don't want them to be, particularly the rock crest. You don't want to let it get real weedy. But they basically can be a free crop that can provide a rapid cover of the soil and particularly good in, in situations where you've got a slow growing crop that's well enough established that it's not going to be dominated by this crop. But will actually, these crops will germ, quick, germinate quickly enough that they will outcompete the other weeds that might be a problem. Um, Purslane, I've kind of talked about already. I, a lot of people probably know that one. It's a favorite weed of mine. I eat tons of it. And it is the highest readily available source of plant-produced omega-3 fatty acids. So it's a nutritional powerhouse. And years ago, I read a book called Weeds, Guardians of the Soil. And in there, the author, basically his career was determined by a day of weeding. He was, he was earning some extra money as a young teenager someplace in the Midwest, I forget where, and he was weeding a cornfield for a farmer. The farmer brought him lunch and a cool drink in the, at, at, in the, at around noon and sat there and ate and talked with him. And he looked and saw that there was a lot of purslane growing under his corn. And he said, you leave that pusey, which is the local name for purslane, you leave that in when you're weeding. Don't pull it out. And that young man came out in the summer to see how the field he had weeded was doing. And it was a drought. And in the area he had weeded the purslane out, corn was all dried up and dead. And where the purslane was growing, it was abundant, and the corn was green and thriving. And that caused him to enter a career where he wrote a, what is a great book. I think it's out of print, but you can find it um, for not too much money if you want to buy it. And I think it's probably, you can probably access it online, too. It's a really a great book. The other thing I remember really seeing was a diagram he had of like a few purslane, I mean, a few lamb's quarters and amaranths allowed in each row of potatoes. And then he showed how much soil opening these great big tall weeds were doing for the whole row. So it's just interesting, important to note that these kind of weeds are really vigorous and great bioaccumulators and they thrive, they germinate quickly, they cover the soil quickly, and they're edible. They can become incredibly weedy, so remember that. I'm not saying there aren't you know, caveats. Um, all right, fenugreek flax, I've already mentioned what I want to do with that one. That's a new one as far as I'm concerned. Fenugreek, I've grown it once as a cover crop. Uh, Peaceful Valley Farm Supply in California actually sold it as a cover crop, and they may still sell it as a cover crop, but I have not been able to find it in a bulk quantity. I finally did, and I can, I can backward engineer that, dig through my box for receipts. If somebody wants to know, they can contact me at pat at livingwebfarms.org. Um, but I finally found a company that sells organic fenugreek seed for sprouting. So I was able to get, I think it was 45 pounds, or maybe it was 55 pounds for about 160 bucks. We're going to grow a lot of that as a crop to grow for seed. But it's grown widely in India. They grow it as a cover crop. They, they grow it as a food. They grow it as an herb. The young greens, and I don't know the name of it, I'm not that knowledgeable about Indian cooking, but my coworker Ian was a chef, and he said, oh yeah, you go to the India stores and you buy this bunch of greens, and it's fenugreek. And I love those kind of crops that can work as a, 
as a cover crop, but also as a food, and in this case as an herb. Fenugreek is an important, important herb um, and also a, a major constituent in curry. So it's got a whole lot of uses. I also am real interested in it because even though reading about it, I haven't seen this, but I planted it in late summer because that is when I understood it would do well. It doesn't like super heat. And I remember it surviving some frost. And any crop I can get that'll go into the cold season but eventually die, that's a total winner. Because that allows me to plan on a crop killing itself for me and doing it at a way that I can stage the timing of it. And have different, I could, you know, if I want to keep it going longer, I can pull row cover over it. If it's at all hardy, that means it's going to keep living until I cruelly decide at some point, you don't get to live anymore. I leave the row cover off and then it freezes and dies. So for me, that, that offers a lot of um, flexibility. I last did this 20 years ago. I might be misremembering that. Maybe it's not at all hardy, but I remember pretty much it being there in late November, which in those days would not have been any plant that was not at least a little frost hardy. So that's some of the reasons. It's also a legume, by the way, so it's going to be fixing nitrogen. And it's very succulent, so it's one of those ones I think about for the grow zone because it'll rot away quickly. So to me, it's got a lot of promise, and I plan on doing a whole lot of experimenting next year, and I'll keep you all posted, okay? Um, all right, gallon soga. This is one that I now eat every day all summer long. I eat it at least once a day, almost every day anyways. Not every day, but just about. You all know this plant. You may know it in a much, much more weedy looking stage. Right now, it's at the prime time to cut. And even if it's got a few more flowers, it'd be OK to cut. But very quickly, it's going to go from this low growing, dense cover to this incredibly spidery, airy thing that's nothing but flowers and seed pods. And that can drive you nuts. It has the greatest collection of non-complementary names I've ever heard. You know, the, the French call it German weed, the Germans call it French weed, um, summer devil, white weed. One of my favorite mountain names is no business weed. It's got no business being in your garden. Well, guess what, folks? It's got a lot of business being in your garden. It was a major food for South and Central America prior to the Colombian, pre -Columbia, in pre-Columbian times. It's an incredible nutritional powerhouse. And it's actually on the, or was at least anyways, on the home page of the Colombian Embassy. It's a significant, important constituent in one of their national dishes, which is a stew that includes a 220 day or so mealy potato, corn, tomato, and what they call wasca, which is, I'm pretty sure, always dried gallon soga. I haven't even tried to dry it yet. I just eat it all summer. There's more than enough. I could dry tons of it and eat it all winter. If you look this up, you'll be amazed at how nutritional it is. It's also one of the weediest things I've ever seen, and I love it for that because all summer long, I have this stage that we see right here. You know, I have this dense, low stage that I can come in and cut handfuls of really easy to use food. The stems are tender enough, I can just chop the whole thing up, saute it, and have it for lunch or breakfast uh, you know, any, any time of day. It's one of my favorite summer foods. It has a really nice flavor that my niece described as kind of like artichoke. Uh, how to describe flavors of, of dissimilar plants is I can go on for a long time about all the plants I read about being described as tasting nutty. I don't get nutty at all. I get distinctive flavors, but I don't get nutty. So I wouldn't say that it tastes like artichoke myself, but my niece would. Anyways, I highly recommend it. You do want to control it. If you let it get past the stage where it is good to eat, it's going to quickly put up tons of seed heads and stalks. And it'll be quite competitive with your plants, and it will also make tons of of new weeds for later on. But like I said, for me, that's a plus because they're germinating somewhere in my garden anytime all summer. It looks just like this, and I could grab, grab big handfuls of it um, and take it home to eat. You know? So to me, it's a total winner. Um, amaranth, I've spoken quite a bit about. I'm sure other people would think, you don't want to grow that. That's a horrible weed. There is a version of it that I recommend you not grow. That's spiny amaranth. I'm not recommending anybody treat spiny amaranth Amaranth is anything other than something to get out of your garden. It's got one of the longer, sharper, translucent thorns that I've ever seen. If you grab that in a hurry, boy, it'll hurt. It'll hurt a lot. So I'm not talking about spiny amaranth. But the other amaranths, and indeed there's a bunch of cultivars that are grown for grain or grown for ornament and indeed grown for dye. It's got a lot of uses. 
And as I said, in the Caribbean, it's a major, major and cherished green. And then finally, lamb's quarters. So both amaranth and lamb's quarters can also be used as a grain crop. Lamb's quarters actually is a, a first cousin of quinoa. And it looks just like quinoa when it first starts growing. And its seeds can be used like quinoa. Both amaranth and lamb's quarters, lots of small, highly nutritious seeds. You do want to be sure to rinse them very well. They're coated with saponins that were you to ingest those saponins, they would be hard on your liver. But if you rinse them really well, they can make really good grain. And if you're, if you're into doing like deeply sustainable um, production where you get as much food as you can from your land, you might want to avail yourself of that. For me, they're all crops that I could use as alternative cover crops and as food. And indeed, lamb's quarter is special because maybe, maybe along with the fenugreek and with the cress, um, maybe not with the fenugreek and for sure with the cress, it will take cold. You could grow that well. So it could be a early, early spring crop that you sow as a cover crop. And it could also go well into winter as a cover crop. And once again, you can collect lots of seeds and grow it densely. So this is probably my most out of the box, you know, weird one. A lot of people think, I'm not growing weeds, but I've been an advocate for weeds for a long time. And I still am. They are dynamic. They're far more vigorous and almost in every case, far more nutritious than any of the crops we grow. And we can use them as cover crops. And for places where cover crop seed is expensive, this is the answer. You know, I definitely want to encourage anybody that's in communication with places where it is hard to come up with cover crop seed. Go for these plants that make tons of tiny seed that you can collect yourself and spread. And then use them as food and control them that way so that they don't get out of control. Because if you don't, they will get out of control. And then you'll be mad at me because your crops are going to be negatively um, impacted by them. But if you do it this way, your crops are going to be positively impacted because of the exudates they're producing, the soil protection, protection they're producing, and the other weed suppression that they are producing. Note, not a single weed that I'm recommending here is a perennial. I'm not recommending perennial weeds as a cover crop. Okay, so some portion of all the plants on that last slide are edible, you know, and some of them, every bit of them is edible. Tillage radish, you can eat all of it, including the seed pods. Now, I would suspect that these seed pods are a little big and might be tough. They'll certainly be hot, I promise you that, you know. They'll be hot and juicy. They might also be sweet if it's been cold. But like, let's see if I can get this guy to show it here, right? Oh, darn it. Right there and there. Those are seed pods that are small enough that they'd probably be quite delicious. All these ones that are swollen, like these guys over here too, to the right, um, that I'm kind of blocking actually. Let me step out of the way for a second so you can see them. Well, maybe I can't. Okay, anyway. Um, there's some seeds, seed pods over there. Those younger seed pods are the ones that are going to be quite delicious. So I recommend those. Um, you might even decide that they're a crop. If you had a lot of radish going that was all in the good forage, good stage, you could cut whole. I wouldn't try and pick them. i just cut whole. Um, stalks of, of seed pods and take on the market. There is, by the way, a radish they sell for seed pods. It's got the, one of my least favorite names of any crop. It's called rat tail radish. It's got a long, succulent seed pod. I'm sorry, that is not a metaphor that I like. That's not an image that appeals to me. Um, but I'm a farmer who's had to deal with you know, the fact that rats and farms go pretty well together. So I'm not a big fan of them. Anyways, all of the blossoms on the clovers are edible. Um, the growing tips of pea shoots, and we're going to talk more about that, of peas are edible, both when they're young, but also as they get taller. All of the tips are edible. And the way to spot if that pea shoot is going to be tender is if you look at a, a pea shoot, you'll see that there's leaves that come off the stem. And then after a few of those leaves and the tendrils, there's a bigger leaf. And it actually surrounds the stem. If you pick your pea shoots right below that big leaf that surrounds the stem, everything above it will always be tender. You know, why pea shoots to me are not a long-lived crop, because they certainly will make shoots forever, is that pretty quickly it's hard to cut a lot of those in a hurry. When they're young, they're all kind of close together, and you can get a lot that are basically all cut right at that place, and they're tender. But as they get older, 
It just takes too much time to pick enough tender shoots that it's worth the money. By that point, you're probably just picking them for yourself and for your salad, but not probably not for harvest. Um, the seeds and the flowers um, and the sprouts of sunflowers are edible. And indeed, I have to check in this more, but Carrie Lindsay, my old boss at the Highland Lake Inn, talked about grilling the entire immature seed head. Now, I don't know if that means that he's just eating the young seeds that are grilled. Um, I'm sure he's eating the young seeds before they have a shell on them because it wouldn't be worth grilling and then trying to shell them. But I don't know that if any other part of that seed head is edible. But that was, there's always a new thing to learn about the edibility of plants, that's for sure. Buckwheat sprouts are edible. And I don't have it on here, I forgot to put it on there, but of course fenugreek is you know, part of the national cuisine, cuisine in Italy. So. And then the flowers and the flower buds of all the brassicas, the kales, the turnips, the um, radishes, all those are also edible. So there's a lot of food in your cover crop. Okay, um, you, if you're gonna kill a cover crop in the summer, you have to be careful. Um, a lot of cover crops, if you wanna try and kill Sudex in the summer, if you don't use an herbicide, which I'm not recommending, um, you're not gonna kill it. You know, even if you flail mow it, it's coming back up. Now there's an advantage to that if you do it in the right place because every time it comes back up, as I've already said, it's pushing its roots down really low. So you actually get a major benefit from doing that. Um, but you're not gonna kill it. So you wanna be careful not to plant it where you're gonna plant. So this was a, a mix that we made, we designed pretty carefully. We picked different, different um, millets. There's taller and shorter millets. Pearl is a taller one. Prozo and German foxtail are shorter. Um, and German foxtail is particularly important to me because if we're kind of late on getting a summer cover crop in where we want to plant a fall crop, it'll mature in 60 days. You know, some of the other ones might take 80 or 90 and that's not going to work for us because you can't kill them until they're senescing. But if they're senescing, when you roll them, they'll die. So we combined here millet, um, sun hemp, and sunflowers and then let them get good and big and roll them down. And there was a, a bunch, I just went out, drove back over to the farm to catch John Henry Nelson, who I work with, and I wanted to run my take of what happened out here this year, last year rather, this is a picture from last year, with his. We did not get, even though this looks like a lot of biomass, and I talked with John Henry and he said, Pat, that was a lot of biomass, that should have worked. It didn't work, and you can see that there's spaces where we ripped to put the plants in are opened up a little bit, but there's even a little bit of space in between. Last year is the year I call our grass disaster, and it was just the perfect year for grasses to grow. It was cool and moist all summer long, and the grasses loved it, and they came up through this and they drove us nuts. Eventually, we solved this problem, but it, I'll show you how in a minute. You have to have, if you're doing organic no-till, you have to have a fallback position, or you're gonna lose your shirt, you know? And there's different ones. I, my friend Mark Dempsey, um, who I gave a talk with last week, by the way, that is going to be available if you, join, if you participate in the Carolina Farm Stewardship Conference, and I have a, have a link here for you there, um, on the 10th of November, and then we'll have a, a question and answer session later in that day, the Zoom session, so we can talk to people about it, which is pretty tangential to this talk. I Originally, this talk and that talk were one talk, but I broke them apart so I could do one for us and we could do one for the, for the Carolina Farm Stewardship Association. Um, and in talking with Mark Dempsey about, Dempsey about his problem, he, among many other things that he does for Carolina Farm Stewardship, helps to manage Lomax Farm, which is their internship, um, uh, what do they call them, incubator farm, right? So they're working with young farms, young farmers, not so much interns, but rather where farms, farmers can take a patch, an acre or two, and practice farming with, with support and with resources. And he said, Pat, same thing happened to us in 2019. We got destroyed by grasses, but we solved it by using silage tarps. So we grew that biomass, and when the, when the grasses and the weeds wouldn't stop coming up through them, we just put silage tarps right up to the plants, and we had incredible production. But if we didn't have those silage tarps, we would have lost our shirts. So you do have to think about um, something else that you can do, and we're gonna look at some other solutions. But this just, it didn't work for us. I, I went out and talked to John too. I said, what are some of the other solutions? And we'll look at some of the things I'd thought of and some thoughts that he had about it, okay? 
So this was a really innovative solution that John Henry came up with this year. Our John Henry and Ian came up with. I just got to film it. I love seeing it. It's not the best of pictures, but if you look on the left side, you'll see a long black row out there. And that's our cucumbers. And basically, John Henry has learned to use our manure spreader, which is side discharge. If you're buying a manure spreader, boy, do I recommend a side discharge one. If you want to use it for mulch, it's pretty perfect. If you want to lay out compost windrows, it's pretty perfect. I think it's far, easy, far easier to control than a rear discharge um, compete manure spreader. Anyway, what they did was they took, we have a bunch of big pots from another project we did, and they put one over every cucumber, and then they just came through and dumped tons of leaves on it. You can see here where they've opened them up, and then you can see um, right here in the lower corner where there's two that haven't been opened up yet. And so that, that worked really well. The cucumbers had no weeds, and it was far more labor intensive than just rolling down a cover crop, but it wasn't that hard. We got it done pretty quick. I've since then thought, well, if you didn't have pots, if you had ground cover fabric, the black fabric that a lot of farmers use to control the weeds in their paths or for um, nursery crops or for other reasons, you could basically make a very few hoops probably um, and put hoops over and just a few staples over your crop and then throw the, throw the leaves on that. And that would probably help you to pull that off and not have your leaves be covered up. We've actually also just dumped the leaves and kind of dug the plants out. But that's a lot slower. If you can keep a bunch, a bunch of the leaves off of the plants, you'll do great. Now, this is easily said by us because we are in an urban area and we can just tell several landscape companies, come dump your leaves here. And we literally get hundreds of yards of leaves that we quickly spread across our farm to control weeds. So it's, it's a huge resource for us. And if you don't have that resource, then you have to, gonna go, have to go to what the next slide's gonna show. Um, nope, it's not this. It's the next slide after this one. Um, this is just to show you what the cover crop that you just saw a picture of looked like when it was growing. It is a lot of biomass. You know, John Henry was saying, Pat, I wouldn't think you didn't have a lot of biomass there. We were impressed with how much biomass we had, but it wasn't enough to control those grasses in a rainy, cool season. But I talked with him, how could it be better? And I've been thinking about that ahead of time. And he, he agreed with everything that I put out there, and he had some thoughts of his own, too. Um, and the big thought that I had was, let's get some more um, filler in there. So fenugreek, you know, it's kind of this airy plant. If we had a bunch of that in there, would that add some more um, mass to what we're putting down? It would probably rot away pretty quick, but by the time it rotted away, it might have inhibited those grasses long enough that our plants would be starting to canopy and we wouldn't need to have that protection. They'd be there as grasses, but they wouldn't have access to the sun, so they wouldn't matter to us because they're annual grasses. They're not a big deal for us unless they're competing. You know? So that was one of the ones I thought, we won't be doing that next year. Next year we hope to actually grow a crop of fenugreek for seed and maybe the year after we'll have enough to try that. This year I'd say we'd probably try determinate cow peas for a, simil a similar use. I'd use determinate because the iron and clay, the vining cow peas, they can get so robust that they're hard to kill um, without flail mowing. I mean, we don't want to flail mow. We want to have as much residu residue as we can sticking around. In the forefront of this picture right here, that's all sun hemp. And then deeper in, you can see it bigger, being bigger and taller. I've got a, a link on one of my ending slides to an interesting article. In that article, they say, don't grow it with anything else because it outcompetes them. The other things won't do well. Well, I don't think that's the case here. In the front here, you see that, but I think that's just because of how things were seeded. We had millet and sunflowers that did quite well here too. But I am now thinking from what they said that this might be an excellent, sun hemp might be an excellent um, smother crop because if you do grow it densely, and I've got a picture that will show you that, it pretty much will exclude light for anything else. So sometimes multi-species isn't the way to go and that's when you're growing a, a, a smother crop. A smother crop is a crop that you grow to, that, to grow so densely that it smothers out the light for the weeds that are trying to come up. And it may also be a leopathic, or it may just like be such a good grower that it hogs all the nutrients and all the water. So that's what a smother crop is. Buckwheat is one of my favorite smother crops, and now maybe this. But it's another concept that we may not cover more, so it's good that I cover it right here. OK, so the other thing that we might have thought, thought about doing was fertilizing this crop. If we fertilized it, we might have had far more biomass. And that ties right into the the first um, 
talk that was in this new series of live stream talks that we're giving, and that's Dan Hettinger's Waste Not Urine. That video's up, and I highly recommend it. And indeed, Dan's really good about talking about being sure that it's safe to use the urine. And there's lots of ways you want to be sure. It can be perfectly safe if you're care careful. This is human urine we're talking about. But um, in this situation, even if you were less careful, it would hardly matter because it's going to be a solid three months from when you plant this, you know, early on, fertile, you wouldn't fertilize it now, you'd fertilize it in the early stages. Not three, I'm sorry, not three months, six weeks um, before you're then rolling it down, putting your other crop in. You're going to easily hit the, basically the standard that's, that goes for all of how we relate to waste products that come from mammals that are very good for fertility but may have pathogens that, are, that we can also be bothered by is the, what was the organic standard and now is the food safety standard. That is, 90 days after incorporation, it's safe to harvest any crop that's not touching the ground, doesn't have soil touching it, okay? But it's after incorporation, or 120 days. Well, we could easily figure this out so it could be 90 days um, before the plant that you're going to harvest has, has any, any um, interaction with the soil that had the urine put on it not the cover crop, but the plant you're going to harvest after that. That would easily be 90 days or 120 days. Um, well, how you get incorporation is by the mowing down, um, and that covers where you put the urine in, so you've now incorporated it. So that's a possibility. Um, I think it's the future. Interestingly, people who know about it talk about the fact that before we hit peak oil, we're likely to hit peak phosphorus. Peak phosphorus is not something that people who are doing Diverse cover crops and encouraging mycorrhizae have much to worry about because the mycorrhizae can access the phosphorus and indeed too much phosphorus will shut the mycorrhizae down. But if you're doing industrial ag, you count on having fertilizer in a bag that's been treated with acid. Its minerals have been treated with acid so it's readily available. And we're running out of that mineral. So that's going to become a problem. But if you're using your own urine, you've got plenty of phosphorus right there. So that is another piece of that solution. Just a little hats off to Dan for a great workshop. I'm not going to be not nearly as articulate about that as I am right now any longer. Okay, the other solution, and this is a longer term solution, is animal integration. That may well be the secret sauce of our how to, how to not have a weed problem and do no-till. And we are inspired by biodynamics. I don't have time to go into why right now, but we are. And we're also aspiring to actually be a, a certified biodynamic farm. So we have to be committed to that because one of the tenets of biodynamics is that all of your nutrients come from your farm. And they believe, and we fully agree with them, that you can't have dynamic fertility without having an animal component. That is the way the world works. Animals and plants together create fertility. We don't do it independent of each other. So this year, Mark Dempsey, our friend who I talked about a little earlier, who I did a Carolina Farm Stewardship Workshop with, which will be available if you join the conference on November 10th, um, and I and Rocco and John Henry and I were all sitting out looking at a plot that we wanted to do a no-till trial, trial with. And we said, Mark, I don't think it's going to work. There's too many grasses and way too much vetch. He said, yeah, we're not going to be able to do it. And then we all looked at each other and said, what are we going to do about this patch? This is a disaster waiting to just cause us future problems because all that vetch is going to go to seed. All those grasses are going to go to seed. And finally, Rocco said, we need cows. And we've been wanting to get cows anyways. We got these cows from our Florida farm. They're a special breed from Zimbabwe. They're Marshonas. I've got a link that describes them more. They're particularly good at eating a great diversity of cover crops. They're excellent foragers. They're small stature. They're also pretty good at doing this right here. You never see these guys scattered out. They're always in a tight herd, which really makes mob grazing work really well. And so we brought those over, and, and hats off to Rocco. He basically has them at our Grandview Farm, which is about five miles away from our North Farm, where we had this vetch grass problem. He got all the fencing installed, no small feat, and then he literally takes the um, cattle trailer and moves this herd back and forth. When we need to have the animals chew down, 
and suppress a cover crop. We, we want, I mean, a weedy crop or a cover crop. We want them to always get it in the boot stage, right, right as it's making seed, before it sets seed. That's an ideal nutritious time, nutrition time for them and the perfect time for us because they're going to get it before there's any hard seed that make it through their digestive tract. So they're not going to be reseeding for us. They're going to get all the nutrition. And we basically put those cows out on that patch I described, which is about three acres, and they cleaned it up. When they were done, there was nothing but flat residue and lots of manure. And then we just plant that into a summer cover crop, which then is going to create the incorporation we need so down the road we can come back in and no-till roll that down and plant. So it's, a, it's got a great future, um, and we're real excited by it. We've also seen, as John Henry was saying, that also, if we'd, be, if we'd been sure to graze animals over a cover crop before we put that summer cover crop in, everywhere we've grazed the animals, the fertility has been incredible. We've seen far more vigorous cover crops. So we want to get to a place where we always have the animal grazing happen before we plant our final cover crop, which is the one that we're going to no-till drill into anywhere from six weeks to four months later. So that, that to us is a, a big piece of the future. We're all pretty on fire about it. I can go on about that a lot longer, but no time. So we'll just move on. All right, so this is the slide that I promised you two slides back. I forgot the order. Um, and there's Mark in the red shirt down at the very end. This was a failed experiment. The experiment failed not because of the cover crop, but because we were trying to use a no-till tobacco drill that was pretty old. It was given to us by a wonderful man named, um, oh, I'm forgetting his first name now, Morrison. His first name I'm forgetting right now. But anyways, it'll come back to me. John Morrison. John Morrison is an incredible innovator, uh, made, his, his, made his career as an expert on tillage, and then became the president of the No-Till Society as he, as he was going into retirement. And he invented a thing called the Morrison Cedar that we'll look at and talk about a little later. But he gave us a no-till tobacco planter that we tried to use here, and we just couldn't get it to work. The soil's too, way too rough here for that. It's a heavy clay soil. And we basically just tortured all of our seedlings to death. So the overall experiment didn't work. But we did grow, in the course of about six weeks, enough cover crop to set up a mow and blow situation. So that's one of the solutions that we see to this problem of getting cover crops to die. We want to grow, like I described, a setup where we have a planting zone with something that's going to die easily. And in this case, it's higher lignin as it gets older, but this is a pretty young version of it. This is young sun hemp. And we grew nothing but sun hemp where we're going to plant. And then adjacent to that, over here on the, um, on the left, that's all got the multi-species mix in it. Lots of Sudex lots more biomass. The other thing about that is the Sudex and some of the other things in there, they're not going to die when we, when we roll them down or cut them. So we can come through and cut that and use that biomass to mulch once this sun hemp is rotted away and our plants need more mulch. What we want to get to, and we were about to try experimenting, except for we killed all of our plants and ran out of time, um, is where we can have these brassicas, what we planned on sowing into here was brassicas, have them sown, have them get maybe five or six true leaves, so they'll be about a foot to 12, 14 inches tall, then come through, mow down our cover crop, and we're going to try and develop a way to blow it over on top of, and then we can shake it down around this crop. For, if we, for this year, if we'd gotten the, the brassicas to work, we would have mowed it down by hand and just carried it over and mulched with it. Why I picked this mix was because of a at the um, Southeast Cover Crop Conference, Stuart Weiss, who I mentioned a little earlier, along with Danielle Treadwell, two extension agents, one from Florida, one from Virginia Island, Virgin Islands rather, did a, um, a series of blocks of cover crop trials. And they had one where they cut down a, a very rich legume and then they mulched it with Bermuda grass. And I said, I bet if you look underneath there, that you're going to see incredible soil life. Because I've learned that if you take a really rich, succulent waste product, like actually I got taught this by Bob Cornegy, a brilliant biodynamic grower who has since passed on, but he taught me that you could take food waste, 
as long as it wasn't anaerobic, cover it with four inches of hay or straw, and it would rot in a matter of a week or two. You'd get incredible soil activity, and you'd have nothing left. And so that's what we wanted to capture here. The, the sun hemp is succulent at this stage, very high in nitrogen. If we took our cover crop, put it on top at that stage, it would create this basically dynamo of sheet mulching. So that's an added way you can do it. And we're going to take a break in about five minutes. I'll finish this slide, and then we'll, we'll take a break. Um, essentially, you're looking at here our roller crimper. We'll talk about that a little more in a moment. But this is where you need a crop that will roller crimp in the summertime. And mostly what you saw on the other slide was we grew ones that were old enough that they roller crimp because they were senescing. But here, we're able to kill the sun hemp because it has such a brittle stem. So you can kill it at any stage. To me, that makes it a summer star. That high nu nutrition, that relative succulence, so it'll rot away quickly enough to feed that grow zone, but stay long enough to suppress the weeds in the early stage, total winner. The other point I want to make is that Earthway, Earth, I'm sorry, Earth Tools of Kentucky, um, Joel of Earth Tools, made this roller crimper for us. He makes them to order. Um, and it's cost about 1,200 bucks. It weighs about 300 pounds. He made it for us to use it on our walk behind tra tractor. None of us like using it because we have to walk behind it or offset the handles such that we stay out of the way of that roller crimper if we're backing up. And that um, is not, not something that causes a lot of confidence. We're all a little bit nervous when we do that. So it hasn't been our favorite way. Rocco figured out that we could put it on our ATV, and it works like a charm. I bet you could put it on a lawnmower, a riding lawnmower, and pull it that way too. Um, and so for us, that's been a real winner. And so essentially, the other tweak that I'd say might help us with this, so if we had the, the lignus cover crops growing on the side, then when our rolled down mulch didn't work, as it didn't in that picture I showed for our fall crops, we could have taken this growing summer crop that would keep regenerating mulch and put it there instead of leaves. For us, we're probably going to leave, use the leaves because they're easy to get. We've got a spreader, but I don't want to offer an option that's only going to work if you're lucky enough to live in a place where landscaping companies deliver you hundreds of yards of leaves. So this is the other solution to the same problem. And it's similar except for you're growing your mulch rather than using leaves that are delivered to you. The other piece that John Henry um, spoke about a while back, and it, it's kind of stuck with me, and you could kind of see it, um, or the potential for it. Let's go back a couple of slides here for a minute. Right here, you can see that this no-till transplanter we have, it makes these furrows, right? And these furrows are great for getting plants in, but they're also wide open. There's no, there is no biomass protecting us from the weeds growing. And so, Weeds come up like crazy in those furrows. So what John Henry said is he wants a water wheel transplanter. And what's different about a water wheel transplanter is it doesn't rip open a strip. It's a wheel that has a bunch of big spikes on it. And those spikes pop open a hole for you. And you can make a bunch of different sizes if you can make a water wheel transplanter that you could change the wheels on. They're not made that way. They're made with a set spacing. Above here, um, it's not enabled, so, but, but um, there is actually a link. Um, if you just punch, punch in farm hack water wheel transplanter, that should take you to plans for making one. So this would be a real expensive piece of equipment, but you can make one for considerably less, and they've had good success with it. They did point out that the plans meant for it to be an 8-inch spacing. They only got a 6-inch spacing. That, to me, is a plus, because we want to oftentimes plant plants further apart than six inches, but not as much as 16 inches, which would be if there was an eight inch spacing. So what we could do if it's only a six inch spacing is we could have a setup where we stuck one plant into the transplanter that was the crop we're growing and the other one that was something like sweet alyssum or cilantro or one of the other low growing cover crops. And so they would spread and create that living mulch and we'd have our spacing um, we'd have a foot spacing. So that, to me, is a, a better design. Anyway, that's it. I guess the link is down bottom here now. Farmscape, or is it? Nope, it's not. I don't know what that is. All right, anyway, the link is there somewhere, and we're done. We're going to take a break. Five minutes.
Okay, we're back. I hope everybody got a quick refreshing um, break there, but let's move along. So here we see tools that you can use for roller crimping, and there's a, a huge array of them. We actually have another one that we'll show too, but the simplest of all, I did this for a no-till workshop, is some source of weight and something with an edge. So I used heavy chain, rope to hold it, and a tomato steak. And I would basically would drop it down so the tomato steak hit the cover crop, and then the chain dropped on top of that, and that would crimp it. And if you didn't get a good crimp, you could step on it too. And then here you see the roller crimper again. Um, and the one point that I didn't make a lot in the last slide about that is that literally John Mashey of the Veterans Healing Farm came to borrow at one time. They had the wrong hitch. They discovered that two men, I say men on purpose because I bet it was a lot of hard work, are two really strong women, are weaker men like myself, um, you know, are not myself probably. I don't think I'd want to do this at 70 years old, but two, two strong, healthy young people, I shouldn't have said men, but really strong, healthy young people um, managed to roll, roll or crimp this. But it does weigh 300 pounds before you put the 50 pound weights on both sides of it. So it's, it's pretty heavy, but they were able to do it by hand and you could use it that way. There's another solution that um, John came up with, but you might think that that much weight is just going to compact the soil, but because it's spread out and because the cover crop is also distributing weight, you can literally actually drive over a toad abode, as I call it, call it, call it, and I describe it there, and the toad will live. We, first time we used our roller crimper in our Grandview greenhouse, we had toads popping up all over the place. They were all kind of looking like, what happened here? You know, but it actually worked fine, and the toads are in a little hole. It doesn't crush it enough to bother those toads at all. We didn't didn't hurt the toads, so that's good news. Okay. So, sow and mow is another surefire way to establish a cover crop. It depends on rain. You can actually literally sow into, and here I hand sowed because I didn't have our Earthway um, distributing seed or broadcast seeder, but I'd recommend that. You'll save money on seed. Hand sow into this cover crop, then come through and flail mow it, which is what you're looking at here. That's the bed that had, had that cover crop in it, and Eight days later, there was a super moon and a lot of rain. That cover crop is six inches tall. So that's, that's a real winner. Um, it works every time. It doesn't work at all in drought. Even if you have sprinklers, we have sprinklers. It's not enough rain unless you run them all the time. You need to have rain for this to work. But it works really well. And you can do this into not only cover crops, but weeds or crop residues. And it works wonderfully that what you mow on top provides the mulch you need for that cover crop to grow even though you haven't incorporated it. Okay, and this basically, this slide says the same thing, so we're gonna move right along. Um, this is the Morrison no-till cedar, and you could use this to plant cover crops, um, but it, the problem is you would have to drive over where you seed it because it can only do one row at a time. Mark Schoenbeck has done a similar thing to doing a, a one row cedar, but he used an earthway so he could put them really close together. And we have it linked to his talk up, and he tells you what size seed plates to use for putting every cover crop in. This actually is also good for strip tillage or for planting crops, but it's not good for beds. It has to be in rows. John Morrison described this so it could even be pulled by a horse. He was a, a, a brilliant innovator, and we are going to miss him forever now, but anyways. Um, this shows that you can actually use strip tillage into cover crops and grow into thick, heavy cover crops and get wonderful production. And here we did a whole area that way using the Morrison tiller, um, both as a cedar and as a strip tiller. This was like basically clover, clover cover crop um, with grasses in it. We were using it mostly as pasture and we were able to plant plants into it and they all did great. Um, and if you have access to it, Having a no-till drill really can guarantee you germination. Our no-till drill needs to be tweaked. That's why I'm up there. It's designed to just put one kind of seed in. So I was up there with buckets adding different seeds so we could grow the, grow the different cover crops and have the grow zones. It worked pretty well, but it was constant management on my part. My part. But it, it, you cover a lot of territory in a hurry when you have a great big no-till drill like this. And they all, all the seeds come up even in a drought because you get down on that moist soil. Okay. And then here's my genius friend, John Mashey um, of the Veterans Healing Farm. He needed a roller crimper. He didn't have one. He had to borrow ours, and so he came up with making one. This is essentially 
a, a lawn roller, the kind you fill with water to press the seed into a lawn. They cost about a hundred bucks. He went to a local machine shop with some angle, angle iron, had him cut some holes in there so he could take a ratchet strap and ratchet strap the um, angle iron on. So he gets the weight and then that sharp edge and he gets the crimp. John's quite a genius uh, and a wonderful innovator. Okay. This is basically, this picture is here to, to, to set the stage for the next part of the talk. And basically, here you see a cover crop that worked. You're going to see a few more pictures. There's a few weeds in the forefront starting to come up. But basically, this was enough well dried down, dense cover crop that our squash and our sweet potatoes in 2019 did spectacularly well. Um, here you see the no till drill. It's actually sweet potatoes that are being put in there. I'm going to talk more about the squash crop, but you'll be able to see the sweet potatoes on the left. We're not a big fan of this drill. It's, we have yet to adapt it so that the cells, the seedlings land well and every one is planted without our having to come back and reset. It was still pretty fast for the year we did it with the squash. That squash, this drill and the squash crop that I'm talking about now was a spectacular crop, as were the sweet potatoes in this section here. You can see that there's a lot of really great residue here. Okay. There's the squash crop. On the left there is where the, seed potato, the sweet potatoes you were seeing being put in. And they've now canopied. There's no longer any needing, weeding needed. No weeding was needed here at all. And we got a spectacular crop. Um, Okay, and there's the harvest. Some of it, you can't, I couldn't even get a picture of the whole room. But we had a, a wonderful, huge crop with no work whatsoever once we put them in. It was really, really exciting. And so that's, that's no-till working the way we want it to work. Um, there you get a close-up, I, I said without any weeds, but you see a few little weeds in there, but not enough to cause a problem. I accomplished a similar thing back in 1997 when I came back from first learning from Dr. Elaine Ingham about plants and their exudates, and I wanted to have plants growing everywhere. We used to just do lots and lots of leaf mold to protect us from getting weeds in our um, squash patches. That was less than ideal because we were getting the leaf from a leaf dump, and that leaf dump also had a lot of nut sedge and mugwort in it, so we were causing problems. It was good to get away from that. Essentially what I did here was so as I was starting seedlings, these are not direct plant squash, they're seedlings, right? As I was starting seedlings in the greenhouse, we sowed buckwheat. And then we put the seedlings out. We mulched around it with grass clippings, you can see there, so that the row that I created, I basically sowed buckwheat over the entire section. Then I came through with a flamer and flamed open rows for the squash, okay? And then where the squash went in, we used grass clippings so weeds wouldn't grow there. And then a dedicated organic um, hero, Robin Kahanowicz, a longtime Carolina Farm Stewardship member. She was working with us then, and she came out twice a week and used head shears to cut back the um, buckwheat as the squash ran, it's winter squash, ran into where the buckwheat had been. The buckwheat rotted away pretty quick, but it suppressed the grasses and the weeds that would have come up long enough for the squash to grow over it and canopy. And once again, a huge bumper crop. This was a 60 by 100 foot area, and we might have had 10 or 15 um, amaranths and lamb's quarters and stuff like that in the whole patch. It looked really nice, which was really important for the Highland Lake Inn because that's a basically um, customer-driven um, display garden. So highly productive, too. We had um, tractor, trailer, tractor front end loaders full of squash coming out of there. This shows the role of, of temperature. To the left, you can see a big, tall crop of a grain corn. It was probably Bloody Butcher. Um, and it's really healthy and fine. It had buckwheat like this in it when it was first coming up. Except for the buckwheat's all from self-seeding from years where we didn't get it mowed down soon enough. We didn't plant any of it. And so that corn there would have been impacted like this corn, except for the buckwheat doesn't do well in hot weather. And so the buckwheat germinated here. It was probably, the corn was probably planted in late April. The buckwheat germinated, started to grow, but then it got hot and dry. And the corn totally outstripped it. And the buckwheat was a nice insectiary that kind of suppressed the early weeds. And it was really, worked out really well. Here, this corn went in at the end of May when it cooled off, like I said, to be June was like April. The buckwheat got almost five feet tall 
totally suppress the corn. You can see the corn is in those darker rows, barely doing well. Not doing well, actually. We got a lousy harvest of corn. Uh, had we been able to come in with a harvester and harvest the buckwheat, it would have been a bumper crop. So that's just something to be aware of. The temperature really affected it. Meanwhile, the temperature didn't as much affect the squash, and the squash is doing great. That squash is now growing into what was left of the corn that was trying to grow in the middle row. So temperature can really affect which cover crops do well and how the crops perform with those. Corn does not do well in the cool, and the buckwheat easily outcompeted it. Okay. Pea shoots interplanted as a cover crop amongst cauliflower can work really well. I think we've got a slide that shows it at the same time, yeah. Um, Mark really, he, we used the same slide in the talk I gave last week, and he said, that's got to be clover. But if you look close, that's actually pea shoots. We've got a close up in the next picture. Basically here, I came through after the cauliflower was established well enough that the peas couldn't compete, probably at about the four true leaf stage, and came through on a week that I knew was going to be rainy with peas that I had soaked. So the radical, the beginning of the root, was just swelling away from the pea. And I basically just sewed them into what was a light um, leaf mold, leaf mulch. The leaf mulch was suppressing the weeds so that the cauliflower didn't get covered up by the weeds. And then I brought this other cover crop on top that was also a major food crop. It's a particular um, pea shoot I'll talk about in the next slide. But we got about three solid cuttings of pea shoots before they just weren't growing in a way that they were cost effective to, to harvest. And they, they nourished the cauliflower rather than, in, rather than impacting it negatively. And indeed, they actually helped the leaf mold to rot and provide even more food to the cauliflower. Um, these are the peas we use. It's called Holon Dao. I wrote an article for Mother Earth News, and they researched it and came up with the fact that Holon Dao is spelled different in Chinese. But phonetically, Holon Dao means pea shoot. It is the best pea to grow for pea shoots. It's only available from Stokes. Are, that I can easily find is only available from Stokes, Garden, Stokes seeds, and you have to be very careful to make sure you get the untreated seed. They have treated and untreated, and you don't want the seed that has a U before it. There's a number for the seed. You know, that all these um, catalogs have numbers for their seeds, and in the number for the treated seed, there's a U, and you do not want the seed with a U in it. You want it without it. You get your crop of pea shoots in about 10 days, they can produce several cuttings, and you can even have it that if the weather cools off, even if it's, if it's summer, you might get a crop of peas. So they're a real winner. Okay. Here is another example here. I sowed cover crop into a heavy leaf, mold, leaf mulch in a greenhouse, and we got abundant, solid cover crops underneath our brassicas. You can see we've been picking on these collards for a while, but the cover crop is coming up strong. And basically, our experience was that our crops did better because of this. We actually, they went longer. It was like, usually in a greenhouse, we're going to plant our, our tomatoes sometime in April or early May. And the cover, the brassicas were still doing incredibly well. Usually they bolt it because of the heat, but the cover crops were cooling the soil and they were doing that respiring that I talked about, that air conditioning. And one day on a hot, a hot early May day, Jeremy walked out of the greenhouse with an armful of kale and said, Pat, our kale and collards are doing better than as if we didn't have anything growing underneath them. So it's a real winner. And here, the same experiment, I planted cover crop into beets before we harvested them. And you can see what that looks like a little better in an upcoming slide. And this just is saying that I was worried that it wasn't going to be enough seed because it looked kind of sparse back there. I thought I might have to come back and sow more seed. But in the end, it filled out, and that's the same bed where the beets were. So you can see there was plenty of seed. And you want to be careful. For sowing underneath crops, you don't need as much seed as you might think you need. So you can save money and maybe not create a problem. And this kind of shows how early on the beets, when they were you know, about three weeks out from harvesting, they're impacted by cold. This is in a greenhouse. It's January. That's why they look like that. But they were still producing. They made decent sized three inch roots or so. But at that stage, I sowed the cover crop right into that. The cover crop is really struggling. Also, I thought it's going to be disturbed when I pull out the, seed, the roots. But literally, because we watered right afterwards, even the ones that were pulled up as we pulled out the roots simply rerooted, grew, looked like that after we harvested it. You can see it's thicker there towards the back um, where we haven't harvested yet. And then by the time we're ready to plant tomatoes right here, you can see this cover crop is not as lush as this one over here, 
which had been in when we first did the sowing, but still a great cover crop to have when you wouldn't have had time if you didn't do this. So it's a real a winner. You can actually sow into root crops about three or four weeks before harvest. You won't hurt them by harvesting, and the cover crop will actually then give you a nice um, growth of cover crop before your next time round. So this is just showing more of that under sowing, also under sowing a, a, under kale, and then you can see here, kind of further down, where the cursor is, that's a lush, full cover crop there, coming on big time. And that's the kind of cover crop that made it work for us. So that's a real winner. Um, now we're going to talk about insects. So cover crops are an incredible habitat for insects. And essentially, if we're going to successfully have balance on our farms and not have to try and struggle with insects, what we want to do is maximize the diversity of insects we have. And that is what we're doing here when we grow cover crops. That's an incredible diverse area for all kinds of insect operations to happen. That is recreating the original wisdom. And the original wisdom of nature is incredible productivity, maximum solar energy captured, maximum diversity in all forms. That's why I don't like to just talk about insects, because there's going to be toads in there, there's going to be birds in there, all kinds of life in your cover crops, just ramping up the life. And that life is the fertility. You know, and that is the original wisdom. Um, pretty interesting, we're going to talk about it quickly in the next slide, but right here, if you look at that, this slide, if it comes up, um, and we won't wait long for it to do it, if it's, it's either going to pop up for us or not. Um, yeah, it's going to real quickly pop up. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, got it. Okay. Cow peas have extra flow nectaries right at the top of each bean coming off. There's a bad guy feeding on it, and that's what happens. So I don't like to call any of them bad guys. That's a, that's a member of the ladybug family. That's a, that's a bean beetle. And it's feeding on the extra floral nectary. It's a pore right at the top of each bean as it's coming off. But that's also going to feed all kinds of parasitoids um, and pollinators also. Right, I'm right here. Right at the, and I, where the bean's coming I'm wondering off. if this is going to Do we get right close there. up pretty quick on this? Yeah, OK. There's the bad guy, quote, quote, the rogue of the ladybug family. And you can see it's feeding on that. And good shots of a whole lot of action will be good too, like where you see a whole lot of flying around. You can Close see the life the flying all around. The There's a, a wasp feeding on the extra floral nectary. See it, you know? And there are extra floral nectaries on different parts of plants. These are about basically getting the insects to come in. Not only is that wasp going to feed on that, but if it's starting to leave, it notices that there's a caterpillar. It's going to grab that caterpillar, chew it up, and take it home and feed it to its um, young. As you saw an ant there, ants are in the same family as wasps, they're hymenoptera. And so they also are going to really benefit from this extra floral nectary situation. There's also going to be flies in here, all kinds of good flies. There we got a fly right there. You know, that's a, probably um, a fly that's also going to lay its eggs um, next to a, a, benefic a, a pest. A whole lot of them do that. They're going to use the pest as a nursery for their young. Right now, it's going to feed on the extra flow of nectary. So we could watch this for a while longer. It's, I love this. It's really fascinating. This is available on our website. You can see a wasp right there feeding. Um, just watch the whole thing when you get a chance. We're going to get right out of this right now, though, um, and go back to the slideshow. Which, how do I do that now? I close so we this. We have the sunflowers, the cow peas, and the sun hemp all have extra flow of nectary. So that's like this is like the extra extra flow of nectary heaven. You don't want me to, to run your slash. Yeah. <laughs> Which one is it? Well, oh, right, is it there? Oh, look at the size of this grasshopper. Yeah, we got some big grasshoppers. There actually are predaceous grasshoppers too, but that's not one of them. Yeah, just come in and do it. Okay, we're back. Okay, right here. Got two, two unusual ones in one plant. Anyway, folks, there's a bunch of plants. I'm going to talk while he tries to figure that out. Um, there's a bunch of plants that have extra floral nectaries. Some of the ones that I can think of 
are all of the vetches that are cover crops also. All the vetches, fava beans, sunflowers have extra fluoronectins. You know? So there's a, a whole array of, um, of plants that have extra floral nectaries. And that means that in cool weather or when there's not anything flowering, you're still nourishing our insect life, which is critical. Insect populations are crashing because of neonicotinoids and Roundup and other, plant, other pesticides that are messing with their gut biology, that are messing with their immune systems, um, that are causing sublethal poisoning. That means they can't compete. They can't find their way to their crops. Um, there's lots of things that are at war with insects, and we are not going to survive as a species without insects. We don't have a chance. We need them for so much, it's, it's hard, to, hard to imagine. Um, and so that is a winner. I love sharing that um, little bit of a video. I recommend watching the whole thing. It just is wonderful to see the life that is on the extra floral nectaries of the cow peas. But there's plenty of other plants that also have these extra floral nectaries. All right, so if you're growing brassicas out there, there's going to be cross-striped cabbage worms. That's what this was. And there's going to be imported cabbage worms. We all know about worms on brassicas. If you let those populations build up, you'll get the predators, the Peconid wasp, that control each of them. The problem is that it's kind of hard to do that if they're eating your crops. But if they're your cover crop, what do you care? It's all going to work out. And then what's going to happen is you're going to have high levels of these Peconid wasps ready to move from your cover crop to your crop, which is also being impacted by these pests. And that's what that diverse cover crop is, is doing. It's providing these opportunities for these pest-predator relationships to balance out when it doesn't matter to you, when you're not losing money because it's balancing out. It's kind of hard to wait, and indeed it's a mistake to wait for what happened here on the left. This is cross-striped cabbage worms, on a, not on a cover crop, but actually a crop. But basically, they come together. They're gregarious. And I made the mistake of thinking I didn't have to use BT. I could wait for the predator to show up and control it. No, I couldn't. There's actually right here, and we'll get a better close-up picture, that's actually a cluster of the Baconid wasp that controls the European, European cabbage worm. And that is the cabbage worm that attacked this plant. And that, you can see, that amount of damage is not a problem. That actually just means that the food that's growing on this crop will be more nutritious. But this amount is a problem. This is past threshold, and you will lose money. If you had that growing in your, in your cover crop, though, you wouldn't care. It wouldn't matter. Another cover crop would take over. Meanwhile, I've got pictures that show like five or six of these, cab these cross-striped cabbage worms all parasitized. Once again, later on in the season, they're going to hatch out and fly over to your crops where you're being attacked by cross-striped cabbage worm, and they'll hit them early enough and hard enough that you won't have to spray BT. And so here, here's the, cross, the, the European cabbage worm, and it is also toast. Dick McDonald has taught me that you can tell if it's infected because it looks a lot fatter than the average cabbage, cabbage worm. When they get infected with the Braconid wasp, which used to be inside this worm, right, they get lighter colored and fatter. And here, it's dead, and the, the Braconid wasps have all moved out, made cocoons. They're getting ready to hatch out and go do it all over again. And so if you have the brassicas in your cover crops, these natural balances are going to occur in a place where you can afford for them to occur. And that diversity will then spill over into your cash crops and save you money, save you time, and save the world from spraying any pesticide, even one that's as relatively benign as Bt. Bt, by the way, is Bacillus thuringiensis. It's a soil bacteria that's been used for a long, long time to control various insect pests. It paralyzes their stomachs. It's incredibly targeted. You have to spray it on the crop they eat. They have to eat it for it to hurt them. And that's a total winner because it's not hurting anything but what eats the crop. Okay. So here's another example of cover crops nurturing beneficial insects. Um, right here, um, you have Pennsylvania soldier beetle um, on buckwheat. Pennsylvania soldier beetles are wonderful egg eaters. They will really tear up the eggs of all kinds of um, possible pests, and they'll tear up the eggs of other other insects too. They're not going to look at a ladybug egg, egg and say, I'm not going to eat it. But overall, they're really about balance. Um, and then over here is actually not a cover crop, but it was an easy picture that I could get out of my computer to show you the benefit, benefits of having an aphid infestation. This is a reliable aphid infestation that happens in the mid-spring for us every year in the mountains. 
um, on, our, on the goldenrod, which is a fine farmscaping plant, but also um, a little bit too, too aggressive to be a cover crop. So it wants to be on your edges. But this could as easily happen on peas in your cover crops or on the kale in your cover crops. Infides, infest, infi, aphid infestations happen throughout um, cover crop plantings. And every time they happen, every predator in the neighborhood comes around. So you've got a ladybug, ladybug there, and then right over here, you have a uh, lacewing larva. And the lacewing larva actually has a, an aphid in its mouth. And then up there, there's the beginnings of a Braconid wasp parasitized um, aphid. So you got three predators on one aphid infestation. You could have four or five. So aphids are actually good as long as they're where you want them, which is not on your crops, but on your cover crops. Or maybe on a crop that's finishing that you no longer need to have do well. So I don't get rid of aphids. I celebrate them as do all of my um, beneficial insects. Okay. Here's an example of taking advantage of the fact that we had that same old thing, buckwheat coming back from having self-sowed. Here it worked out wonderfully. We actually, we tend to plant beets as plants. We do better that way. We planted rows of beets, and then buckwheat all came up in them. Now, you can't let the buckwheat stay there. It's going to start to impact this crop, right? But I looked at it and said, you know what? It's going to grow faster, and it's going to suppress the growth of the chickweed. Remember I talked about how quickly chickweed can take over? And the hen bit, both two really fast-growing, Early, um, early canoping winter weeds, both of which are edible. Um, but you just don't want them growing in your beets because they're going to be hard to weed and they're going to start to compete. The buckwheat, on the other hand, yeah, it's competing too, but it's about to die because this isn't a greenhouse and it's, it's cold. It's probably November. The only reason the buckwheat's been alive is it is 1 16th hardy. It'll survive a really light frost, which means if we use row cover, it can survive a hard frost. So there's been a bunch of hard frost, and we've kept the buckwheat going, continuing to suppress those other weeds by using row cover. But it's about to, come up, to run into a harsh, harsh reality, which is we're using it. And we're going to leave the row cover off, or we did leave the row cover off for the next really cold night, and it all died, and the beets were released. So that's a way to use a cover crop in a really innovative way to control a really Tedious weed. I'm trying to weed chickweed and hen bit. That's a real pain. If you can get buckwheat to suppress it, that's a real winner. Um, here you can just see where we had grasses and stuff. It didn't work very well on the left, but where we had residue like on the left side of the left pick, of the, I'm sorry, it didn't work very well on the right. Um, and where we have residue like you can see on the left side of this left picture, we sowed into that, we sowed white clover, and as the residue released it and rotted away, we established white clover in our buddy butcher corn patch. Now that part of the farm is a really wonderful stand of white clover that we can plant into. So that's another way to take advantage. You do need the rains, once again, to make that work. But, by the way, the smaller seeds, like clover seeds, are going to work better with less rain. The bigger seeds they're not going to work as well. So if you're going to try and under sow or sow into another crop and it's kind of dry, you're going to do better with something like clover or purslane or one of those small seeds. The bigger seeds, it's not likely to happen. Okay, That's another show, shot of the same um, squash crop. We're not going to talk about that again. That gives more details, but you can go back and read it if you want. Um, here's an example of using a cover crop, and you can't even see the cover crop anymore. John Rowland sent me this picture when he saw I was doing a no-till um, talk, and I love using it. I love the contribution from my community. John Rowland has our farm in um, Weaverville, I think it is, in North Carolina. And this is a, a mid-spring picture. He had a whole, this field was in oilseed radish. Oilseed radish gets basically severely damaged by deep cold, um, also known as tillage radish or forage radish. And he looked at it, saw it was going to die, and just took a bunch of spinach seed and seeded it into the radish. But another thing that the radishes do is they're great scavengers. They are really going to grab up the nutrients and they take up all the excess nitrogen in the soil from the rotting previous crop, all the excess phosphorus. And then they die off slowly. So in this situation, he sowed the spinach. It didn't do that well. It was too dry. It, it germinated, but it just didn't grow. But then the radish kept riding away to the point where we don't even see it 
The rains came back in April, and he, for the cost of spreading spinach seeds, sold hundreds of dollars worth of spinach. You can see that's some pretty nice spinach there. So just you know, think about it. Your cover crops can actually be placeholders for your next crop if you have the right conditions. And it's kind of a theme. You need to have water for this to work. If, if you try and do this in a dry season, you better run the sprinklers all the time. Anytime you're just sowing the seed and not incorporating it, it's a lot harder to germinate it unless you're getting rains. All right. Um, this is just showing that we were able to establish crops into really, really rough ground with rough residue using the Morrison, um, Morrison cedar. Um, and here, just that it, it worked that year. You know, this is actually a slide from 2019. If I were doing this, the same talk, I would not have used this slide in 2020. But that's just part of the harvest that came from that squash patch. Um, and then finally, you know, a lot of people can't afford a, a key lime plow. It's a wonderful tool for opening up your soil. But you can use the crops that I'm talking about and animal impact and get the same kind of results. We can use life to do with what this heavy, expensive, carbon embedded, heavily carbon embedded equipment does. So I think basically we can stop there and take questions. There's a bunch of resources here. Um, you can access those and we'll probably put some more on this page after the fact. Um, but I highly recommend the David Brandt talks, the Mark Schoenbeck talk, and hopefully we have Ron Morris's talk here. We will put it up if we don't. They're all talks that cover this too that Living Web has in its library. All right, let's take questions. I think you might want to need to repeat the question a little bit since I'm far away. Okay. Um, all right. Blissful Acres Off Grid Homestead asks Can we plant cover crops under young fruit trees and later use it to feed pigs, turkeys, and chickens? Uh, the ground, she says, your ground is bad. They've got heavy winds and hot, hot summers. Yes, you certainly can do that. The one caveat I'd offer there okay, so the question is can you plant cover crops under young fruit trees? and then feed turkeys and chickens. For one thing, probably not first year fruit trees. They want to be big enough that the turkeys and chickens won't hurt the fruit trees, right? All of those animals will really wonderfully impact the cover crops. You can't leave them there very long. The pigs can hardly be left there any times at all. The pigs will love those rich cover crops. That'll give you real pastured pork, but you don't give them time to even really rut in it. They get to go through there in maybe an hour. You know, you run them through, and then you run your chickens and turkeys behind. You can't run chickens and turkeys together, by the way. There's a disease that the one brings in. I think it's turkeys bring it into chicken. No, chickens bring it into turkeys. So you can't run them together. But you can run one or the other. And once again, they can spend more time there. They're going to pick through the, the pig poop and eat the parasites out. You know, go after the flies that go after the poop. They're going to get every last insect they see and eat all the, all everything the pigs left. They're going to clean it up really well. Um, but if you leave them there longer, they're going to start scratching big time and they're going to tear up your plants. So they can, they can have maybe a couple hours, you know. So this is going to be a heavy management situation. If you're going to just leave them in there, then let the trees get considerably bigger and the pigs still can't be there very long. Pigs can really tear up some land. Okay. Are there benefits to cover crops with indoor plants? Well, actually, there's a slide I didn't use showing turmeric with purslane growing in it. And I'm sure that benefited it. So if you have bigger indoor plants, they will be much happier with other plants. It is just not true that plants don't, plants don't want company. Look in nature. It doesn't happen. So absolutely, you could grow things like, I would actually work on, you know, use the things that are food too. I would play with the, the, the cresses, the purslane, the gallon soga. They would work great in your bigger pots. Your smaller pots, there isn't going to be any room. But if you've got bare soil anywhere, you don't want bare soil whether it's outdoors or indoors. You always want your soil covered. So yes, I hadn't thought of it, but use those cover crops on your, on your indoor plants too. Okay. Um, on white clover, if someone was going to combine white clover, and they actually talked about vetch, which I know you do not recommend vetch, but they were talking about white clover and vetch and buckwheat, and they were not going to terminate it uh, what percentages would you recommend? And of course, I think you're not recommending vetch. Well, no, I really want to back off. I, I misunderstood if you think I'm not recommending vetch. I'm not recommending vetch if you want to do no-till. I grew vetch and loved it for as long as I was incorporating our flail mowing. But if you want to roll and kill your cover crop, it's not going to die. If you're going to graze it, 
or you're going to come in and mow. I mean, clover is going to love mowing. It's going to thrive in that situation. So it was vetch, clover, and what else? Buckwheat. Buckwheat, okay. I would recommend, um, you know, they're different sizes, so this is not about weight. I would recommend um, that you would use, well, I guess i got to tell you weight, though. I would use, let's say, for, let's say 10 square feet, okay? I'm making all this up. This is just like, this is an idea of proportions. You're going to have to go back and look at the rates and figure it out yourself, because that's what I would do, right? But I would use proportionally, I would use, let's say, 40% um, clover and 10, maybe, no, I'd use about 60% clover, 10% vetch, and then um, clover vetch, and, what, and then the rest buckwheat. And then what I would do, this, this is going to work great. If, you, if you're not going, to till, not going to use it as no-till, just when the, when the buckwheat's already gone to seed, you can keep the buckwheat going longer if you want by mowing the flowers off with a weed eater. So you can keep it in flower for as long as you want the vetch there. But there's going to come a point where the vetch is trying to go to seed, and it's also going to be growing over your other crops, right? And at that point, you just come through with a lawnmower or a weed eater and cut down to the clover. Clover loves to be mowed low. The clover is going to thrive and dominate, and get, dominate, give you a permanent cover crop, and these other two are going to make, invigorate that area with all the good stuff they add. Phosphorus is known, by the way, to be great for mycorrhizal relationships in the, whereby the mycorrhizae are really good at exuding acids to make phosphorus available. So buckwheat, I mean, uh, buckwheat rather, is the, is the one to use if you want that to happen. So it's a great one in this mix. It's not something I thought of, but that's the good thing. You all get to take these crops and cook up your own mixes. You know? Okay, so if someone wants to mix vetch and radish, will the vetch shade the radish too much? What's going to happen is the, the, the polite aspect of vetch is its childhood. It's a very well-behaved child. Okay? It's when it's going into teenager and adulthood that it gets a little out of control. So you sow the radish and the vetch in the fall, right? The vetch is just not going to grow all that much in the fall. The radish is going to take over. And this is not a bad combination. I'd put a grain in there too myself, but maybe, for, maybe you're talking about these because you're thinking I can kill these pretty easily by mowing. So if you didn't put a grain, then the vetch would eventually be the one that was really doing well because the radish is going to winter, winter damage in cold weather or in hot weather it's going to go to seed, and the vetch is going to last longer, okay? So you're going to end up with the vetch shading the radish yet, but the radish is already toast. By the time the vetch is taking over, the radish is either going into senescence and going to be finishing anyways, giving you radish pods or whatever, or it's rotting because it was damaged by the cold. So that vetch is going to be what's going to rule. So you can do that mix for sure. Just know that you're not going to kill it with a roller crimper. Okay. So... How many years would you recommend animals foraging cover crops before the land is ready to plant, if you're wanting to fertilize the land with animals? Um, if you have time, I always think it's a great idea to build your fertility for a few years. You don't have to do that. You can just start right away. You know, If you need to grow food, then you just go ahead and plant your cover crops, graze the animals over it, put another cover crop in so you get that separation from the animal stuff, right? Um, the animal waste. Put the other cover crop in, and as soon as that cover crop is nice and big so you can mow it down and it drops on top of the remnants of the manure and the urine, you now have incorporation. Now your clock starts tip ticking as far as food safety goes. You can put transplants in there. Transplants are going to be what's going to work. If you're going to do seed, you probably have to wait longer, right? Because you don't have the incorporation. Unless the way you, if you actually, you could do seed, you'd have to work up a row, though. And then you're still incorporating, right? Um, but then you put your plants right into that cover crop, and now you have gotten all the benefit of that animal impact, and your crops are growing, and they're mulched by your cover crop. So I wouldn't wait, but if you can, what I recommend for almost anybody that's starting out is do one or two beds that you do incredibly intensively, and you set them up so they can grow you lots of food in a small space. It's amazing how much food you can grow in a small space. And then improve your soil with cover crops and animals, if you possibly can, and the rest of the area, and then slowly expand and get bigger as your systems happen. You know, if you try and put in a great big garden with a lot of animal impact and stuff, you might end up with a lot of weeds. But if you just ace a couple of small beds and use the animal impact for the rest of it, that'll work. 
but you don't have to avoid the animals on that, that other section. You just need to make sure that after the animal impact, you put one more cover crop in so you can get your incorporation. Okay, another question. Can I weed eat ryegrass and kill it while perennials are starting to sprout? Zone 7A. You know, there's a, a no-till conference I might try and attend virtually, and they're going to talk about how to manage ryegrass. All the farmers I know stay as far away from ryegrass as they can get. Ryegrass really can get weedy. Ryegrass is not rye grain, okay? Um, and it's a nasty weed. It's a lot of the, of the annual grasses that are driving us nuts right now. They're ryegrass. It want, every, plant in the, every plant around has one goal, right? It's reproduction. That's what life's about, right? It's about the continuation of life. So it's hard to kill your ryegrass without a lot of heat and really scalping it low or incorporating it. If you're not incorporating ryegrass, it's probably going to go to seed, and it's a problem I don't want. Does that sound like I answered that question? Okay, good. I, I, as I got into my dissing ryegrass, I was losing track of whether I thoroughly answered the question. Obviously, folks, I said that I'm not, not recommending vetch. I'm just recommending that you know what it, its qualities are. I'm actually not recommending ryegrass. I'm looking forward to somebody in our community here correcting me on that. I've heard people make it work, but I have not made it work. Okay, let's think about this. Okay, so they just bought a Christmas tree farm, and I love it. They're going to actually grow cover crops under the Christmas trees and run animals through it. That's a wonderful plan. I love that plan. What would they grow? I think you'd probably want to include something like white clover or another clover that would be there long term because you don't want erosion. You want to have a permanent cover crop there. But I would mix into that depending on the time of year. You know, it's a good time to plant clover is in the spring. You can kind of frost seed it if you're in a, in a, in a cold area. That, that thawing and freezing will help to pull the, cover, the clover in. But I'd mix into that if you're doing a spring. I'd mix in oats, um, which are excellent forage. I'd mix in, um, if it's early enough, I'd probably mix in crimson clover too. I'd probably mix in the oilseed radish to open it up. Um, if it was a little later, I might look at buckwheat. That's also going to give you, it's, what you want to do actually is get a bunch of cover crops in there that not only are going to be decent forage, but also are going to be flowering at different times because Christmas tree growers really want a lot of insects so they don't need to use the insecticides to protect their Christmas trees. You know? um, if you're planting it later, um, let's say you want to plant it for summer, I probably wouldn't try clover. It doesn't doesn't like the heat as much, though if you got some rain coming, it could work. I'd probably then go with things like um, millets, shorter millet like Prozo, and uh, soybeans. Unless you got deer pressure, you might back off on the soybeans. But then cow peas, probably the determinant. You don't want them vining around. Sunflowers actually will work fine in here. Make sure you seed them more towards the center so that the shade is not hurting your plants. Or go for the shorter, there are shorter sunflower seeds. There's also, um, along with the shorter millet, there are shorter sorghums. So I'd go with those. I'd go with the, uh, what else? You know, one that I didn't mention that's not a cover crop, but I think people should look at is Bright Lights Cosmos. It's really good at throwing a lot of flowers that the beneficials like. And it's airy. It doesn't cause a lot of shade. It's more diversity of exudates. And it's real good at getting taller if it needs to so that it'll, it'll compete with other cover crops, but it won't compete with your trees, obviously. So those are some, and then for a fall, if you're putting them in, in the fall, I'd go back to the clover. I'd add the crimson clover. I'd add probably still not rye. Rye is just way too rambunctious. I'd probably go, though, with maybe barley. Uh, probably spring barley, so it might get winter damaged, or if you're lucky, winter killed. I might look at adding fenugreek in there, like I was talking about. Um, and you could still, if it's early enough, you could add buckwheat in there that will flower and carry it along. So there's various mixes like that. You can play with a lot of them. I'd stay away from the vining ones, um, and I'd stay away from the ones that are going to attract deer. But otherwise, I'm just giving you a few ideas. You can really jam on that. But I'd base it with clover because you're going to establish a long-term crop that you can then sow into 
but you'll have that anyways. You know, you might need to drill that, drill other crops in there over the years, but a good basis of clover will really serve you well on a tree farm. What cover crops would you recommend for clay soils on a market garden scale of about three acres or less? Okay, so clay soil is my favorite. I mean, we all kind of hate clay because it's so hard to work and it's so hard to dry out. But if you look at clay under a microscope or you look at sand, you know that clay is your friend. Clay actually has all these spaces that hold nutrients. Sand doesn't hold anything. So if I have to choose, I'll take clay. But you want to improve the tilt and cover crops are going to do that. So that mix that I talked about in the greenhouse, that's a really good one. You know, the, the Facilia tanacetifolia is a star. By the way, Christmas tree grower, get that Facilia in there. That's a wonderful one. That's going to go down deep. It's going to open up the soil for you too. I highly recommend the Facilia. Plant in spring, late summer, or early fall. Um, it's pretty cold hardy. It can even overwinter. It's going to bring in the beneficials. It's going to go down deep. It's going to bioaccumulate, you know. Um, so I get that in there, I get the oilseed radish, I do the rye. I'd also look at fava beans. Fava beans are great for opening up that soil. Um, and then what else? You know, this sounds crazy, but I'd also look at chickweed. You know, for a winter cover crop, knowing that you're gonna have to do your weed management later, later on, but it's just like, when I see where chickweed is grown, it grows anywhere that it's rich, even if it's clay. And what it does with the roots, boy, it just creates this mass of roots with all the exudates and the aggregation. It's a winner, you know. Um, I'd look at it, but it's, this is me being crazy and willing to take chances. It, it, you might be sorry. You can eat the heck out of it, though, you know, so. Okay, last question. And it's not, doesn't really sound cover crop related, but maybe cover crops could help. Why does the food I'm growing smell like it was grown in sewage water? What would be a foul smell? Maybe some anaerobic soil? Or Sounds like anaerobic situations, yeah. I wonder, you know, this is where I wish we could actually be in conversation because um, is it really wet where they are? You know, if it's really wet, and maybe the person can respond to that, you know. If it's really wet, that might cause it, you know. Or another thing might be that, um, you know, there's some wildlife that's enjoying the environment you've created, and that's where the smell comes from, you know. Did you use manure? Manure is going to definitely sell like, smell like sewage. Um, oh, and if you grew oilseed radish, when they rot, boy, do they stink. <laughs> okay, so go ahead. Okay, one more question. What cover crops would you recommend for sandy soils? Okay, biomass, lots of root production. You know, so those rise, all those grasses, they're going to really make a lot of roots. That's really going to help. You want the um, legumes that are going to work with that. The clovers are really going to help with that. But then the biomass makers too, you know, the Sudex is going to give you tons of biomass in the summer. That sun hemp, tons of biomass. So that continuous seeding, you know, you're going to want to grow cover crops under all your plants. Everybody's going to want to do that, you know. Those under sowings are going to really help. And they're going to be ones that stay low. Those weeds I talked about are going to really help, you know. Plants that can really put a lot of mass on in a hurry, put a lot of roots out there. Those roots are pumping exudates in. Those are all going to really help. Um, so that's, that's what you want, is a lot of biomass. And whenever you can do it, biomass, it gets tall that you cut down. Um, you don't really need, if you have sandy soil, you don't really need that deep penetration of the Sudex. But the Sudex, where you're not wanting it to die, is one incredible solar engine. It is producing biomass like you can't believe. Likewise, the sun hemp. So you'll want to mix those up, you know. Grow those other ones that I talk about that do well underneath your plants. Because if you've got sandy soil, you want tons of plants because your nutrition is in your plants. You don't have plants, your nutrients are gone. So you want to have plant roots growing everywhere. All right. All right. If you can wrap it up and then announce that. All right. Okay, so thank you for your time. I thoroughly enjoy talking about this subject. It's a subject dear to my heart. We can answer questions and put them on our radio show anytime. So just get in touch with us if you've got more detailed questions. Give us a little time to make sure we cover them all. And then we'll set a date to have you come on. And we can make that to your time so that we can do it with anybody any in the anywhere in the world. Because I'd love to answer the questions for everybody, not just for one person. Because they always apply. Check out the resources that we have here for you. There's a lot of great stuff. And know that we are going to 
have a grand, a, 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 a special opening right now. Stay tuned five for minutes. part six in five minutes of Troy Hinkey's Healing Ourselves with Compost and Compost Tea. Great workshop. He answered a lot of questions for me. I highly recommend it. All right, grow those cover crops and eat them too. Thanks a lot.